Good morning, everyone. I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you for being here today. Uh, we're going to start the meeting and turn it over to Trustee Margie in just a minute, but I'd like to introduce a few of our new employees that we have. We have our Chief Operating Officer, General Jason Evans. Where is he back there? Okay. The uh, Assistant Vice President of Customer Relations, Ms. Jessica Powell. <laughs> Director of Internal Audit, Dr. Renee Forbes-Williams. And the Assistant Vice President for Design and Construction, Mr. William Radford. Right. Where is he? Okay, he has not come in yet. We'll recognize him when he does come in. Trustee Martin. I'll turn it over to you. I'm sorry. You know, check to figure out if someone called in or anyone, any board members. Who's on the line? Obi McKenzie's on the line. Van Pinnock is on the line. Andre Johnson's on. So I'm going to believe he's on the line. So we have four. Good morning, everyone. The June 15, 2023 Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee is now called to order. At this time, we need to call the roll. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll, sir. Trustee Johnson. Trustee Andre Johnson. Uh, Trustee Bill Johnson. Here. Chair Martin. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Committee members, if you cannot hear or speak to other committee members or board members, please state so now. For each committee member participating electronically, please identify any individuals who are present in the location from which you are participating. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the March 16, 2023 Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee meeting minutes. The Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee March uh, 16, 2023 meeting minutes are included for your review in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I move for the Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee meeting minutes as contained in board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The questions on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee meeting minutes as contained in your board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Trustee Andre Johnson. Aye. Trustee Bill Johnson. Aye. Chair Martin. Aye. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the 2023-2024 tenure and promotion recommendations. The materials for this agenda item are included for your review and board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I'm asking Dr. Glover or her designate to provide information in connection with this agenda item. Yes, good morning, everyone. 
Good morning, trustees. I'm pleased to share with you, on behalf of Academic Affairs, those faculty members that are recommended for tenure and promotion. At this time, I would like to recognize those members, deans, direct uh, report from the various colleges. If you would please stand and be recognized. Again, per university policy, the president recommends granting of tenure to faculty members in accordance with the requirements set forth in the TSU policy on tenure and promotion. I am pleased to share with you the recommendation for 12 faculty members for tenure. And again, per tenure policy, um, I would like to just review with you the process for the tenure review, and that's for the sixth year. A faculty member is required to submit a portfolio of materials in support of their tenure application. The criteria TSU uses to evaluate applicants includes quality instruction, research, creative activities, public service, and professional activities and the potential for per professional growth. The university reviews the tenure candidate's portfolio at several levels, starting at the departmental level, college, and the university. The vice president for academic affairs and the president per policy must approve the application. This comprehensive tenure review and approval process, as well as the list of those recommended for tenure, are included in your board minutes. And again, per the FOCUS Act, the board's bylaw, and the board's delegation of authority to the president policy, the board must approve the awarding of tenure based on recommendation from the president. At the same time, I'm pleased to share with you 18 faculty members recommended for promotion. With respect to faculty promotions at TSU, individual faculty members may apply for promotion upon completion of the required years in rank. A tenure or tenure track faculty member um, can apply for promotion when he or she has achieved the required years and rank and meets the defined qualification for the various faculty ranks, which are assistant professor, associate professor, and professor. And again, to apply for promotion, a faculty member must prepare a portfolio containing evidence of the faculty member's teaching, research, and service since his or her last promotion at TSU. Again, we have, and I'm proud to share with you, 18 faculty members recommended for promotion. And again, per the FOCUS Act, the board's bylaw and the board's delegation of authority to the president policy, the board must approve promotion based on recommendation from the president. And you have the list of names of those for tenure, the noted 12 and the noted 18 for promotion. Thank you, Dr. Melton and Dr. Glover. Any questions or discussions? I move for the Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the recommended candidates for tenure and promotion as contained in board materials for your June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The questions on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of tenure and promotion as contained in board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Trustee Andre Johnson. Aye. Trustee Bill Johnson. Aye. Chair Martin. Aye. The motion is approved. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the approval of a new academic program. 
a Master of Science in Business Data Analytics. The material for this agenda item are included for your review in board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Dr. Glover, will you or your designee provide information in connection with this agenda item? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, the university, with the support of the College of Business, requests approval for the proposed Masters of Science in Business Data Analysis um, analytics degree program and proceeding with submission of the letter of notification to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Again, um, a background information, the College of Business seeks approval for this proposed uh, Masters of Science with submission to the um, letter of notification to THAC and to give you a little bit background, the Department of Business Information System proposes 30 credit hours master's degree to be completed online in 12 months. The delivery method of this proposed degree program is fully online and no in-person class attendance will be required. The primary academic purpose of this professional degree program is to develop professional workforce that is prepared to address the needs of our expanding and need for data in the fields to make better business decisions. Again, everyone, big data has become a major component in the world today. The need for workers capable of collecting and manipulating large amount of information continues to grow. And the Masters of Master of Market Research indicates the need for this workforce. The Master of Science and Business Data is designed to give participant an understanding of how to look at data, identify insight, improve their ability to make long-term prediction, and prescribe future action to help make better business decisions. I'd just like to say I was very impressed with that. With this degree, uh, it is my understanding that uh, no one else in Nashville is providing this mm -hmm. degree. So uh, I, I got a lot of information, good information, and I was uh, excited about what I was able to read. So thank you so much, Dr. Milton and Dr. Glover. Any uh, questions or discussion? Any comments? Life is good. My, my understanding is, is there's no additional cost for this. It's going to be run with the current faculty and just a modification of the curriculum. Is that correct? Yes, let me recognize Dean Shanklin from the College of Business. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Uh, what we had intended to do is to remove a concentration we had within our MBA degree and expand it for marketability and move it online and refresh it with additional new content. And this course will continually be updated because of the nature of technology today. So from the cost standpoint, it's neutral entirely with our existing faculty just amping up the content and moving online. Thank you. Thank you. I move for the Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of a new academic program, a MS in Business Data Analytics as contained in board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Secretary Pendleton, you need to call the roll. Trustee Andre Johnson. Aye. Trustee Bill Johnson. Aye. Chair Martin. Aye. Thank you. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the report on SACS accreditation matters. Information pertaining to this agenda item is contained in the June 15, 2023 board materials. Again, I'm asking President Glover or her designee to provide pertinent information to related to this agenda item. This is informational discussion item owning only, so no vote will be required. 
Oh, you know, I'm happy to um, present this report on, pe on behalf of President Glover, <laughs> um, the entire university. I am so pleased to share with the board the reaffirmation from SAC COC. The Board of Trustee of the Southern Association of Colleges and School Commission, again known as SAC COC, at its December 4th meeting, voted to reaffirm the accreditation of Tennessee State for the 10-year maximum. I congratulate Dr. Glover for her leadership. And with that, um, as you know, in response to COVID-19 pandemic, the Southern Association of College and School Commission of Colleges conducted over 150 virtual visits by peer review. However, again, per their policy, they had to make an on-site visit. Ladies and gentlemen, on April the 18th, the verification was conducted by our SAC COC staff. Um, and again, um, Dr. Anderson would be giving this report, but she is currently at of SAC COC on our behalf. And I am pleased to share with you in terms of our verification visit, um, and I look at Dr. Glover, successful. Again, you need to give all of us a hand. <laughs> and this is followed by the academic program offerings at Avon Williams, our Substance Change Committee visit and that was April the 18th through 19th, and at its meeting on March the 17th, the Tennessee Board of Trustees approved the offering of 50% more of delivered instruction by the Masters of Business Administration at Avon Williams, which prompted a substance change. Ladies and gentlemen, again, on behalf of President Glover, the university received the substance substance change uh, report, and I am pleased to share with you. The president received the report on April the 20th with no recommendation. No recommendation. <laughs> and further, the report from the SAC COC committee included accommodation to the university regarding the TSU Smart Technology Innovation Center, citing it is a true example of an integration of teaching, research, and community service all in one program to support not just academic, but our entire university. So with that, again, I say to everyone listening and in this room, this was a team effort and I am proud to present to the board our findings. And I, may I add to that, please? That yes. is that what you want out of accreditation review is no recommendations. Recommendations could be the uh, a somewhat of equivalent to a finding. And so we got no recommendation. We even got commended for mm -hmm. our smart center uh, that we have on campus. So I thought that was a really good showing for our SACS review. With Dr. Glover and Dr. Milton, I'd just like to say um, I am proud of all the work that has gone into this. We, uh, it does not go unnoticed. Uh, we know where we were, and to be here with no recommendations is huge. And so we know a lot of time and effort has gone in that, into that. So we appreciate everyone for everything you've done to make that a huge success. Thank you. And, and if I can add also, uh, Provost Melton, thank you so much for your effort, Dr. Anderson, for her yes. uh, mm -hmm. effort in leading that, the, the committee, the deans, the faculty, the chairs. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations. I would Jim like Lewis. to uh, ask one question. I believe in numbers. I want to make sure that this number is what I think it is. Does that mean that we have been approved accreditation for 10 years that goes to 2033? 2032. That's all I need to know. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to Dr. Milton Anderson and Madam President. But uh, 2032. All right, I'll see what I'll be doing about that time. Thank you. <laughs>
I understand that too. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next item on the uh, agenda is the academic affairs report. Information regarding this academic affairs and student affairs committee agenda item is included in your June 15, 2023 board materials. President Glover, will you or your designee provide information related to this agenda item? Again, this is informational discussion item only, so no vote will be required. Thank you very much. This is an update of, regarding academic affairs. We have a full report from all of the colleges in terms of our annual review that we will submit to the president and share it with the board. However, I would like to highlight a few items, and I have Dean Reddy here, and I would like for him to stand and share the award of a $18 million project. Thank you all. Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to share uh, the USDA has selected uh, T Tennessee State University for a new grant, the highest we ever received, $18 million competitive grant. This is not a grant that we competed only with HBCUs. We competed across the country, all of the universities, 3,000 or so universities. So there are only two schools that were given $18 million. That's Tennessee State University and North Carolina a and State University. Thank you. <clears throat> what this project does, there is a huge deficit of agricultural graduates in the country. So part of our job is to attract more students. We can incentivize and provide scholarships and so that we can graduate more students. And the USDA is assuring that they will be hiring these graduates from our schools. So that's part of this big process the government is engaged in uh, producing, developing the new workforce for their needs. Thank you. Thank you. And that's just one of many. On behalf of the Center for Extended Education, Continuing Education, we have renewed our partnership with NES, Nashville Electric Service, as a pathway for those employees to pathway their career into our College of Engineering and Computer Science. Along with the College of Health Sciences, we have another reach out um, program called Senior Saints Initiative at Schrader Lane. Again, this partnership will bring support service to our community. And I move to the Honors College. We have a new initiative with East, East Tennessee State University called I-40 HBCU PWI project that will be starting in terms of a collaborative for our st honor students to work with students around the state. In terms of the College of Liberal Arts, I have Dean Morgan Curtis, if she would please come up and share about the Climate Innovation Program with Vanderbilt State University, Vanderbilt University. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Melton. Good morning, Dr. Glover. Uh, I am pleased to share that uh, uh, Professor uh, Sue Ballard in our Department of Art and Design, uh, working with her interior design students, has been active in this. The, she actually took these students over with, to Vanderbilt to work at their Wondry Center so that they got hands-on work in sustainable, uh, upgradable materials, all integrated into their design and in preparing them for the workforce. Thank you so much. <clears throat> And that's followed by just an update from the College of Public Service and the College of Education completed their program state and national accreditation review as well as health science this past week. Again, we have a full report from all of the colleges, but I will end with the Smart Technology Innovation Center, not only because I helped to oversee that, but because we have stepped up 
in terms of the world, not just HBCUs, in leading the educational way for AI, artificial intelligence. We have been tapped to move forward in looking at the possibilities, the opportunities, as well as the danger. We have already in service 100 and two of our HBCUs, and upcoming next week, we have 150 of our faculty and staff at Tennessee State that will have this training. Ladies and gentlemen, artificial intelligence is here to stay. We have to know the possibility. We need to know how to use it as an educational and workforce tool. We are geared, prepared, and we received a uh, award from the Hewlett Foundation to help move the way. And at our next board meeting, I'm here to share with you two other companies have contacted us. We are the research center for artificial intelligence. And again, I hope at the next board meeting, you will allow me to share with you this amazing, dynamic, powerful piece of technology Again, this is only a tool. It will not replace us. On behalf of Academic Affairs, I thank you all very much. The next item on the agenda is the report on the student housing plan. Information regarding this Academic Affairs and Student Affairs Committee agenda item is included in your June 15, 2023 board materials. President Glover, will you or your designee provide pertinent information related to this agenda item? Again, this is informational discussion item only, so no vote will be required. Thank you. Housing resides in the Office of Division of Student Affairs, so we're asking uh, Dean Stevenson if he will do that. Thank you, Madam President, Chair. Um, we, uh, I want to begin by talking a little bit about last spring in, in terms of what we ex executed there and then our housing staffing uh, arrangements that we have um, shifted and then talk a little bit about what's happening for this upcoming fall. Uh, the objective of TSU Housing and Residential Life is to be a premier residential uh, environment that provides students a safe, comfortable, affordable, and engaging living and learning experience while promoting student personal development and academic success. To better serve the students in the housing, the management of residence life has been completely restructured with an emphasis on customer services. We had a successful spring housing uh, plan that we executed, housing all of our returning students from the fall with the reduction of hotels, and we went down to two hotels and uh, without any major incident. We also were um, excited that we were also able to add some transfer students in the spring and provided some uh, had some space for them uh, from this past spring semester. Now, um, one of the things we realized in our housing management structure was that we we really needed um, some assistant directors who had responsibility for different phases of housing and residential life, and so we added two assistant directors. One will be responsible for housing, the other for residential life, uh, really focusing on this one, the student's experience, and then the other uh, in terms of the actual facility. So in working with facilities management, that person will have a lot of responsibility there. And also uh, something that's new that we haven't really had much of in the past, but this, other, this assistant director will also have responsibility for uh, our, our off-campus sites. So House of God and uh, Jefferson Flats and those, we have to have somebody who is managing and being responsible for that. And so we're in the process of hiring the second of the, that assistant director. The first one has been uh, promoted, Mr. Julius Proctor. And we also have a new executive director, uh, Ms. Yolanda Parr, who uh, started in her position on June 1st. And so she, the, the thing that I think is most interesting in terms of her uh, resume of experience is um, she has served as a hall director and has the highest marks in terms of uh, student experiences in her engagement and interactions with her. She really gets it when it comes to student 
the customer service uh, and the student experience. And so that's what we're lifting up with these type of hires. So we're ready for this fall semester, and we've got some numbers here that I'll share with you. Um, a couple of things I'll, I'd like to say, we, um, we have begun the assignments for freshmen and transfer students. So all of the first time freshmen and transfer students who have completed uh, their vaccinations have been assigned, and we're continuing with that. Uh, the the self-assignment, which allows students to choose where they want to stay, that process will begin next week with the first 1,500 giving the opportunity to start their self-assignment. The reason why this is critical is because we do have students who um, sometimes their experience is based on not being where they want to live. And so we have some properties that students don't want to be at and properties where students absolutely want to be at. And so if they have that opportunity and choice, for instance, House of God, there are some students who would just prefer not be there. And then there are other students who like the opportunity of having their own bathroom in their room and they want to be there. So self-select gives us a better customer uh, um, satisfaction as it relates to that. So that will begin on, on next week. Uh, we have also included the, um, <clears throat> the two hotels that we, that we currently have um, have requested as part of the self-select process. Again, that's one of those things where you have some students who really enjoy being at the hotels and others who absolutely don't like the commute, don't like being that far away from campus. And so having, having the self-select option, which is the first time we've had that for the hotels because we, we're getting in front of it pretty early. All right, so in terms of this, this coming fall semester, we have determined that we would um, to accommodate particularly the big freshman class that are now sophomores. That's, that's the group that's kind of pushing us a little bit in terms of, uh, uh, of, um, of our availability of beds. So the, first, the, the incoming freshmen that are coming in now, that number is now back to what has been our historical trends. So we looked at data over the last 10 years. How many students have applied for housing over the last five to 10 years at this same time last year. And so we're right in line with what that number is. So we, are, we're, we're, we understand and we're predicting uh, very succinctly what we think our first time freshman numbers will be. So it won't be 2,000, you know, it won't be, we don't think it'll be 1,500. We, we've got that number right in, in line with where we think we'll be. It's close, gonna be closer to about 1,200 uh, first time freshmen that we'll be housing again, which that is our normal pattern. We're getting close to our normal pattern, right? And so we're, we're predicting that number. Uh, secondly, um, the returning students, again, that sophomore class is the, is the, is the component that we, we had to really accommodate for. And because of that sophomore class being the, the previous freshman class now being sophomores, we did make a request for uh, two hotels for the fall and the spring. Now that was approved by the uh, State Building Commission Executive Committee to enter into leases. That would give us a total capacity as of right now. And I, want you, I, want, I do want to say that this is a moving target. We're negotiating with, with individuals who own property in the neighborhood and uh, we're increasing every day and some, sometimes we have to decrease and take some, some things offline. If a, if, a, if a water pipe bursts or something like that, sometimes you, you, it's a moving target. So you'll see these numbers, but for the most part, 4,368 is the number of bids we're expecting to have for this fall. And we think that will be uh, enough to accommodate. Right now we have 4,081 students who have filled out a housing application. Now, we did pause the returning housing application. It will open up again on July 1. We, it would have been irresponsible to have those students um, promised housing if we didn't have the hotels and we knew we weren't going to be able to accommodate them. So we paused that until we were sure that we would have the uh, hotels. And so we now have, we were planning to open that up on July 1. That allows some of the other students who didn't get a chance uh, because of previous balances or whatever those situations may, may be, they will now have an opportunity to go in and, uh, and apply for, for housing, returning students in particular. So, uh, you know, we've got some students who have applied. That we, we know there will be some attrition, obviously. Some students are not returning. We, we, we anticipate that every year, about 5%. Uh, 
uh, of those that have completed a housing application, uh, between five and eight percent, they will not they will not return for whatever for whatever reason. The number is is um, is typically uh, around the same with first time freshmen, and so we expect some of these beds to be relieved. Now, uh, what what typically happens, you know, in our housing situation is that you have students who apply for housing, they don't counsel their housing, so we're holding them a bed. They transfer, they go to other schools, or they drop out, or whatever the case may be, um, and we've held that bed. And so that's what we're really trying to push over the summer, making sure you're going to be here, right? So we don't want to hold, hold those beds if you're not going to be here, because that, that really pushes us at the beginning of the semester, and then you end up with sometimes some beds not feel. Of course, that didn't happen last year, but uh, uh, sometimes in, in past we would end up with beds not feel. So that's where we are, um, and I know uh, I know uh, Trustee Pinnock uh, has led the committees on uh, on housing, has done a lot of intensive uh, research, and has dug in and, and can share some other things. But we this is the plan that we have right now. We don't anticipate. Uh, we plan really hard not to duplicate those things we have experienced in the past. So we've been very intentional about housing assignments and capacity applications, all of those things. And so I'm very proud of our housing staff that we have in place. They're, they're digging in. Um, you know, one of the things I share with them, and, and they, they understand and they get it, is that, you know, we still have to be responsive. If, if we have one room or 100 rooms, we still have to be very responsive. We have to be very intentional in our communication and we have to understand that the um, the students housing experience is really critical critical to their overall experience in college right and so it matters who my roommate is it matters where i stay it matters you know if the hot water is hot right <laughs> so all those things matter and I, so we really dug in and i'm very proud of of what i think will be what we will present as a student housing experience for the fall we got some challenges. Yeah, we got some challenges. We got some old buildings. We've got to move fast. We've got to get some more buildings. We've got to get some more buildings up. We need some more space. The housing market in Nashville continues to change. And uh, so we're working through our, our housing strategic plan. Dr. Johnson is, is leading that. And I think that will really express where we need to be. So that, that concludes kind of my uh, 30,000 foot over, 30,000 feet overview of kind of our housing plan. Uh, Sure. And thank you for that very detailed report that you just presented us with. Uh, with all the things that you've mentioned in the report, my first question uh, is, do you have the, an adequate staff to handle all that? Have you hired everyone that uh, you need to hire? Yes, yes, uh, Madam Chair. We have uh, presented to the president a reorganization plan that required new positions, new bodies, and she approved that. And we've started the hiring process, and uh, most of those are in place. We've got one or two that we still need to uh, get uh, the hiring proposals completed, but we have adequate staff and we have the right personnel to, uh, to execute the plan. Yes, ma'am. So if I understand what you're saying, then you are telling me that the president approved the plan for the additional staff upon the completion of approximately three more, I'm using approximate positions, then we will have an adequate staff to efficiently take care of what we need to take care of as it relates to housing. That's right. That's right, okay. President. My second question, you mentioned the um, self-select. How is that prioritized as to who so gets it's, to it's do that? It, well, it's prioritized by those who apply for housing first. So everything is in order. If you apply at 1 o'clock, and someone else applies at two, then that we take the one o'clock batch first and allow them to, to start the self-select process. That's why, and I'll be very transparent, that's why when we open our housing portal, you know, we see 60% of students who want housing do it on the first day, right? So they understand, they understand the competition of, of, of needing to get where they want to be. So it's based on when you, when you, when you apply. So, Dean Stevenson, uh, you mentioned you, you're looking for to hire a new director that will be over the house. When do you anticipate hiring that person? So, we've, we've, we've hired the director. It's, it's the assistant director 
and that position is posting now, and we okay. expect to have that, you know, ideally we'd like to have that person in place by August 15th. Okay, and that will be the person that will oversee any housing off campus, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. And when you mentioned uh, you were looking at other facilities outside of the campus, are, are those additional hotels or give give us an idea so, of who you might be talking with? Yeah, so, so right now, most of that has been um, smaller numbers. So individuals, we have a lot of alumni who parents own houses close to the campus. They reach out to us and say, hey, you know, I've, you know, I've got some property that's been vacant, it's in walking distance, and we look at those opportunities uh, as they come available. So we've got two or three that we're negotiating now. Um, but again, those are not, you know, 300 beds, they're just, but they're in close proximity and, and every little bit help. And it also allows us to create what's called living learning communities. And so we can put, for instance, our speech and debate team this year will be living together and so they'll have you know so those living learning communities are best practice models across the nation so it does help us in that aspect so that's kind of what we're looking at but not any any hotels or any big number of beds at this okay. point point. and in addition to the services that we have provided for our students that are not on campus have we changed any of that um, any of those services I know at yeah. one point you increased security uh, so have we changed any anything else in addition no, to that's that? A great, that's a great question. Now, you know, we learn every semester. Mm -hmm. We learn every semester. And so we're getting feedback from students about their experiences. You know, a couple of things we had to double down on was, for instance, the Wi-Fi, uh, particularly at the off-campus off campus, uh, locations. Um, Wi-Fi for hotels typically isn't designed for 200 students to have four devices all connected at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so what would be what would be sufficient for just your regular travel coming in for one night and jumping on for a few minutes and sending a couple of emails is not sufficient for college students who are doing their academic work and research and all of those things. And so, that's one of the things that we had to double down with with the uh, uh, partners and say, we have to have sufficient Wi-Fi, which included us purchasing Wi-Fi devices last semester. And so we'll do that again, but it's obviously that's very costly, right? Uh, we spent about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 just to add a few hotspot boxes, but it was critical and necessary. So that's one. Uh, secondly, in terms of the uh, student experiences, we realized that we also need to increase the engagement. So. What happens is, for instance, like at House of God, they became their own community. And the hotels, they become their own community. And so we have to be intentional about how we provide the engagement for that community. And so we're, we're doubling down on that and adding some more resources and reassigning some of our staff to, to help with that. Great, great. In regards to the Wi-Fi, do you think that one of our partners um, might consider providing that for our students moving forward. I know Dr. Glover has some amazing relationships, so I was just asking that question. Well, I, I'll tell you what, we'll certainly take it because uh, we, when, when the Wi-Fi is not right, you, you know, those of you who are parents, you know, you, you get it, right? Just go turn the Wi-Fi off and see what happens in your house, right? <laughs> so when the Wi-Fi is not right, it does mean we have some very dissatisfied customers, so. Thank you. Just a quick question, if I may. Is that okay? I'm going to turn it on first, right? Okay. Um, thanks for the work that you're doing. Um, you had mentioned that there are certain assumptions and percentages that you're looking at as far as retention or lost students that would, that apply. One of the things that we learned last year was not only that the percentage of those that applied and accepted and came was 30 some percent and actually 40 percent came. I just think as a board, we, we want to make sure that we don't have an issue like we had last year. So yeah. as you're calculating these historical percentages, I want to make sure that we err on the conservative side, meaning maybe have more, use last year as a benchmark. Because I think that clearly what I'm hearing is you have resources that you've been given. We now are a little bit more engaged as far as the numbers go. But I think it's our expectation as a board that we don't have the issues that, we, that happened last year. I think that's fair to say. 
So that, is there anything else you need? But I yeah. want to make sure as you're projecting, we're projecting more conservative to make sure we have, even if we have a buffer of additional house, housing available, we don't repeat what happened last year. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Trustee Corbell, I, I, that we certainly, you know, don't want to repeat anything close to last year, right? And so we are being very conservative in terms of not over-promising, right? right? We, our capacity won't really change. It is what it is. Our supply is what it is. And so what we have to do is make sure, and we've been communicating with students that this is what we have. And, and, and we want you to apply early. And most of, most of them did that. If we look at the so so what we can control is the first time freshmen coming in. The returning students, those numbers for the most part are going to be what they're going to be. But we don't want to give, for instance, 1,600 bids to first time freshmen, and then that leaves the returning students kind of out. So we've limited both. We've said, okay, this is what we're going to do in terms of first time freshmen, 1,200 bids. That's it. And this is what we're going to then. This is what we're going to have for our returning students. So I think it, I think we are conservative, but you know, if if we had another hundred beds, would I feel better? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but we're, I think we we I think we're very conservative, and I appreciate you you lifting that point. Trustee Martin, my, my last question would be: I know we had some initial conversations with a local individual that owned a court villa. Uh, have those conversations continued? Or are they no longer an option? Um, I'll say it's, I, I can let Doug speak to it, but I, I would say that it's, it's still continuing and, and it's ongoing. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, and good, good morning, everyone. I believe it can still be on the table. Uh, that's something that would, of course, uh, require uh, SBC approval if doing so. But I think, as, as Dean Stevens said, we've we're managing where we are, and we didn't want to make sure uh, before we added any additional space that we were approved for that space, such as the hotels. Uh, so I think anything is doable from that standpoint. There's been no conversations here in the last uh, month uh, as rega regards to um, the, the apartment complex, but we'll work, uh, continue to work with Dr. Andre Johnson, see how we can move forward on that, if need be. Madam, may I speak to that subject also? <clears throat> It's sitting right next to the house of God, if I'm not mistaken, right down the street. Now, I know that normally businessmen make the decisions. If we don't have a businessman or woman at TSU that can make this decision and get it to the legislators uh, building commission to get approval, then perhaps maybe it would be to the advantage of TSU to hire somebody to get the job done. It needs to be done. This has been going on for more than two or three years. And there may be a difference in the price offered and the price that we want to pay. But the bottom line is some things need to get done. And I, for one, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for bringing this up. This has been in the back of my mind for over two years myself. And I would request that VP Allen, that you and Madam President and whomever, and you, Chair Cole, get this job done. That's ridiculous to sit back and play around with an opportunity that could help save the university while we're waiting on these dormitories to get built. With that said, I rest my case. We'll make sure that we meet with uh, all the parties and get back on that immediately. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, commend uh, Student Affairs for uh, separating out the housing facility from the housing residential life engagement piece. And I encourage you to keep
keep the focus not just on the first time freshmen new people coming in but the returning students because the persistence numbers as we've talked about before are critically important as part of our metrics for for TEC. and so I, I I congratulate you on that and I I, I hope that this the regi residential life person which I think you said is Yolanda Park is that correct Par P Par P A R P A R okay. uh, that that person will boost the engagement opportunities beyond just the first time freshman class. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dean Stevenson and uh, Dr. Glover and uh, also Trustee Pendleton for uh, chairing the student housing plan. The next item on the agenda is the student affairs report. Information regarding this academic affairs and student affairs committee agenda item is included in your June 15, 2023 board materials. President Glover, I'm asking you to provide information related to this agenda item. Again, this is informational discussion item only, so no vote will be required. Excuse me, um, we're getting some messages about the loss of connectivity on that line. Do we know what? You want me to repeat to Dr. Johnson? Okay. My, my comment was that while we're considering the Court Villa project. I'm going to also encourage us to make sure that we get the total picture of it, i.e., what impact does it have as it relates to our debt structure, um, uh, you know, uh, the, and, and bring us back a detailed report on it relative to what the individual is asking, what we can afford to pay what effect it has. So we have a total picture of what we're looking at. I'm glad to hear you said that too. Thank you. you told me where? Thank you again. Welcome to the Broadworks Collaboration Center. Please enter a conference ID and press pound. Security pin and press pound. Please record your name after the tone and press pound. You will now be placed into the conference. Press star for help. Can you guys hear us on the phone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have Trustee Pinnock on. Yeah. Trustee Andre Johnson on. Trustee Andre Johnson on. Trustee Wimberly on. Trustee McKenzie on. Yes, Trustee McKenzie's on. Okay. Promise my last comment on this. Yeah. Keep in mind that, keep in mind that this Sean meeting Wimberly is being Junior. broadcast. When we have these situations that occur, it does not reflect positive on us, regardless of when we tested and what happened when we tested. Okay, just keep that in mind. And we are um, evaluated from all angles by many different individuals. Johnson. All right. Okay. Are you so you're on Andre Andre Johnson? Okay. All 
right? Should I I'm lost. move Did forward? Conclude our, your Let's do the first okay. one. Very, very quickly, I want to say that we, as it relates to student affairs, we had a, a really good uh, spring semester in terms of engagement, uh, uh, Divine Nine, and all of those things that took place. Our student leadership, uh, really very successful. We had a successful election of our 83rd Student Government Administration, and that went over well. We used a new product this year to, to host the elections, and that product we were very, very satisfied with. Um, as it relates to our health and wellness, I just want to lift that up. Uh, the Division of Student Affairs has made a request in the upcoming budget to increase the student health service fees to better accommodate the health and wellness of our student population. These additional dollars will allow us to expand dental services, counseling services, and health services. This will allow us to increase the student access to dental hygiene services as a part of the larger scope of the total body of health, meet the dental hygiene needs of students around the community, and explore the possibility of partnerships that incorporates the dental hygiene clinic. We will, we will and have increased our counseling staff by 35% to meet the growing needs of our students' emotional well-being. This additional staff will include licensed credential University Counseling Center, assistant director, a permanent part-time psychiatrist on staff to meet the psychiatric and medication needs of the TSU student population, as well as adding additional therapists. Finally, we will be able to add a nurse practitioner to our health center staff. And so the health and wellness of our students is very important. And uh, we, we really need to uh, staff up and, and put more dollars into that space. And so that recommendation will be coming in the, um, in the finance budget uh, meeting, but, but it's surrounding the students' wellness. Uh, we're probably the most important, the, the, the thing we're probably most excited about is that those dental health services, we've got you know, the opportunity through our dental hygiene program to provide those with just the right equipment and just, you know, so that's going to be really good. It's going to allow some, some additional training for our students. And then also uh, just, uh, you know, those students who, who don't have access to those services off campus will have access on campus. Uh, I won't mention the housing plan again. We went through that, but I do want to say that we had a successful career development center fair. Um, it was held on March the 24th in the Gentry Center complex. Um, it was a it was a very tough day. I mean, that was the day, the right after the uh, suicide that we had on campus, and so we had a tough decision to make if we would even have that career fair. And so we did, and there were over 183 employers um, compared to 142 from the previous year in the spring, uh, with approximately 750 students in attendance from all majors and classification. That concludes my student affairs report. Trustee Johnson. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the expanded um, engagement opportunities? Can you talk about intramurals and reaching out beyond the small subsets? I mean, we got six to 10,000 students mm -hmm. that we're dealing with, and we need to make sure we have engagement opportunities across the board, movie nights and, the, and those kind of things. Can you talk about plans to expand those? Yeah, so our... our, our um Office of Student Activities and Leadership is kind of responsible for most of the engagement. And so we, we do two things. One is we help facilitate the engagement and obviously we plan those engagement opportunities. Is We found that it's very, um, where, where you get the most engagement is when it's organic. So kind of student led and when they are kind of leading that space. So we created what we call engagement mini grants for the student organizations particularly around weekend programming, because we, we wanted students to not all go home on the weekend, but to, you know, to have that. And so they've been taking advantage of that. We're going to expand that a little bit. Our intramural programs, we're expanding that as well. You know, we obviously are always competing for space. Uh, I've, I've said many, many times, uh, and I'll say it again, I want to be on record. We are, we're, we're inadequate as it relates to student space for programming and activities. We're severely inadequate when it comes to student space compared to uh, other institutions in our state, and so we have to, uh, you know, we have to address that, you know, and, and be intentional in that. And I know the president has a plan, but uh, the engagement that that we have planned, I think, is going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty exciting for the upcoming year. And there are there is some expansion there in terms of opportunities of motivating the students 
to do some some different things. But yeah, we have all of those things. We we even started something this summer, which we've never done before. We don't, we have have about five six hundred students here over the summer taking summer school. So we started engagement this summer. So we we plan activities for that group. And typically that's that's you know when you go to summer school you're pretty serious right you're trying to trying to get out of here you you know you, 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 you those that's a different set of students right and so we planned around that group and so I've been pleased with that with that engagement Matter of fact they've got something tonight over in the new new residential hall can I encourage you to uh, have your group um, work with HPSS and with the Department of Athletics uh, in part of the master plan planning for uh, student facilities um, and once again, I encourage you to expand beyond just the student organization opportunities, but have those blanket opportunities for those who, who are not necessarily involved in student activities or student clubs, yeah. I think uh, what but I'll have, do have a potluck for them to select from. There, it seems to me that there should be something every single day, and the student should have a choice to say yes or no. Yeah, I think what I'll do, Dr. Johnson, is I, I probably at the next board meeting, if you allow me, I'll let me go into deep a deep dive of what we currently have of, of engagement opportunities because mm -hmm. it's 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 a lot and there's always always opportunities to expand but I want to make sure I give you a, a really clear picture of what's happening in that space. Thank you. The, the engagement is the critical piece for students to persist at the university. I agree and that, with you. And that's our, our, our goal is to get people trained out the door and remain engaged and those those type of uh, non-classroom experiences are the ones that drive our alumni back to us. Absolutely. And we have to really leverage those the best we can. Thank you. Trustee Lewis. Yeah. <clears throat> you spoke, Dean Stevens, about being inadequate. Can you bring that report of inadequacy the next time around? Absolutely. The time to do something about it, in my judgment, is now. So if you present this information, then it's this board's responsibility to work with the president and you and others to get the job done. So now that you've brought it to us and you've said something about, comparatively speaking, how inadequate we are, mm. let's do something about it. Let's not wait. Thank you. I'll make sure I bring that information to the next board meeting. So what they look at is um, student space per square feet by the number of students you have and, and what that looks like for students in terms of their own space. And so that's where the, I'll give you, I'll get share that information with you. Dr. Johnson, in the master plan, do we have um, the information as it relates to this additional student housing? We haven't collected for student housing? I mean, um. Students, yeah. students. Yeah. I'm sorry. We haven't uh, gotten into the details for that piece of it. That's part of the athletic uh, master plan. And if you look at the 2016 master plan, there is a space designated for a new campus union uh, on the 20. So we've been just talking about it, and it's been in, mm -hmm. on our mind since then to build a new campus union, which is a jet would be adjacent to the um, tennis court the city tennis court because we were trying to work out a collaboration for our intramural program to utilize the, tent, the city facilities that were right adjacent to the campus. So that's, that's in the 2016 plan. We just haven't collected all the data to, to move it forward. Okay. okay, well I encourage us to do so. That's what I get for read while I'm talking. I say the wrong thing. Yes, but anyway, <laughs> um, um, please I encourage us to make sure we do yes, get adequate coverage. Okay. Dr. Glover, did you want to add anything to this? No. Okay. Thank you, Dean Stevenson. What did you Secretary Pellington, do we have any uh, follow-up items? No, not, not in academic affairs, student affairs. Okay. Thank you. So is there any additional business? Uh, I'm having a hard time through the audio, so forgive me if this, this question has already been asked. Uh, but, D. Stevenson, I wanted to ask you, uh, well, first I want to say thank you for what your office has done uh, on the behalf of students. Uh, but I do want to ask, how are we 
uh, measuring or determining what our engagement level is? Is that through like word of mouth? Um, do we have surveys that are out to kind of gauge like how we how our engagement is is, is uh, changing from year to year? Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Johnson, for that question. Van Tenhock. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Wimberly. I thought it was Pendleton. Okay. okay. So, and, and the, sorry, and the audio, the audio is, uh, is, is kind of choppy. So it's, I'm having a hard time hearing, but we're going to DC. I apologize. Okay. So our, our assistant dean for student life and student activity, that's their house and responsibility, but it happens across the board. So when we talk about student engagement, it happens in every aspect. If, if a student is in the in the choir, if the student is is an athlete, if a student, you know, is 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 working, all of that is engagement. So it's holistically. Now, as it relates to the division of student activities, they have a a you know a complete list of things that they do that provides engagement and opportunities. But also, we have to do it in housing. So housing, every RA is is responsible for programming every month. They have to do that as well. We have some student uh, some student affairs type of engagements where we bring distinguished lectures and those type of things. So it happens in in terms of uh, in terms of measurement of uh, of our engagement. So we have the students to a lot of the events we have we have them to swipe in. So we're measuring on a couple of uh, notes. One is if we're doing engagement and students don't come that's not what they're probably interested in or we didn't market it right. So we look at the data of how many students attended, what areas are students more interested in. We also rely, I'll be honest with you, on our student leaders. So our student government association, they're giving us the feedback of what things students like and what things we should do and what things we should probably not repeat. So those are kind of the things we've been historically looking at. I mean, it certainly would look at um, you know, some measuring tools, uh, I'm, I'm totally open to that as well, uh, Trustee Johnson, absolutely. It would be nice to have, okay. it'd be nice to have participation counts, it'd be nice to be able to, since you have swipes, um, to determine um, whether each and every one of our students has participated in one, two, or three activities per year, right? The, the data is really, really clear on student engagement, uh, and persistence in graduation. So, yeah, I mean, you leverage that. You 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 are singing a song that I like. I mean, when it comes to student engagement, I mean, more money, more staff. I mean, I like that. You're absolutely right, Dr. John. That is the data. That is the exact. That's the data. And so we're putting our attention there. If you you know you when we go to our national conferences, our national conferences, you know, we hear this every year. It makes sense. If students are engaged, it does affect. Uh, uh, their retention and 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 it also affects their well-being. And those students that go in their room and don't come out and don't talk, they're more likely not to be successful. And not only that, we're trying uh, for student affairs. Um, we're trying to develop students holistically, not just just in the classroom, right? It, it does no good for us to have a student who's a straight A student but can't hold a conversation, can't engage, can't, can't do a, a um, an elevator pitch, right? So I agree with you, Dr. Johnson. We will we will dig into the measurements of it and uh, and and double down on it. Might I suggest that the assistant director you said was responsible for this area be specifically tasked with that charge? Absolutely. Thank you. Is there any additional business? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Any discussion? Hearing none, the questions on the motion to adjourn the meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll, sir. And I take it you just seconded that motion, too. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Andre Johnson. Aye. Trustee Bill Johnson. Aye. Chair Martin. Aye. Most curious. Thank you, sir. The motion's approved and we are adjourned. We want to start back with our committee no. meetings. Do we need to wait on? Yeah. Okay. Do we, Do we yeah. need to wait on uh, VP Allen and Dr. Johnson? Executive. Ex executive, I think we're fine. Okay, great. So, um, Turner Pilton says that we're fine now. So, good morning.
The June 15, 2023 Executive Committee is now called to order. At this time, we need to call the roll. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Here. Trustee Lewis. Here. Trustee Martin. Here. Trustee Walker. Here. We have a quorum. Okay. Committee members, if you cannot hear or speak to the other committee members or board members, please state so now. For each committee member participating electronically, please identify any individuals who are present in the location for which you are participating. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the March 16, 2023 Executive Committee Minutes. Well, I don't know what's... Okay. Can I get a motion? Trust me. Move for the Executive Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 Executive Committee meetings that contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 Executive Committee meeting minutes as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Trustee Lewis. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Walker. Aye. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is a report on the board's committee assignments. Uh, this is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. As chair, I am charged with appointing members to serve on the board's four standing committees and any special committees. During this time, each of our board committees are focused like a laser beam on specific and pertinent matters, including items related to the board's resolution, which we presented to the committee um, downtown. I believe it is important not to lose that momentum as our committee continues to carry out their vitally important charges. We have effective engaged committees and I plan to keep the current committee's composition intact for the next term. I want to thank everyone for your service and work on these important committees. Any comments from anyone? No, you can't come up. Okay. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a report of the board's resolution items. This is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. But I think it. Uh, we would like to go through each one of the items. President Governor, please provide a report on your work in progress on the board's resolution. I did. Uh, we've been working on the Comptroller's report, and that's the resolution. So we have a, a detailed report this afternoon in the meeting. I, I appreciate that, but I would like to go through each item, if you don't mind now, okay. so that I can get the progress on what has been done for each item in this committee. All right, Arlie, can you pull up my report for that now? Yes. Keep going. Uh, keep going. All right, let's go back one. Thank you. We prepared a response to the, the board resolution governing the Comptroller's report on Tennessee State University operations. So we went through each one of the 12 items. The first one was the TSU Board of Trustees is committed. You have it. You want to go through, you want me to, you want to go through what you? Um, well, I want to get a response on each one of these items. So, in the first one, uh, you can continue. Just okay. let me. Okay. All right, because you said you want to do the first. You want to go through it. Okay. Okay. Well, the TSU Board of Trustees was committed to actively engaging in an enhanced oversight of TSU's operational and fiscal practices, including working more closely with TSU management in operation and fiscal um, areas. Okay. So, since the exception of the board, 
you, the board has always taken an active role in oversight of operations. But at the March meeting, the board resolved to take an even more active role in TSU operations. Uh, and and so the, his increases oversight of his fiscal practices and operational practices. The next one. Arlene, the next one. Are you are you advancing? Yeah, I'm I'm just okay. okay. It's here. Okay, the TSU's trustees executive committee will examine the board's current committee structure to ensure the appropriate number and focus of its committees and provide recommendations to the full board if warranted. So the you, the board. I examine the committee structure of the board. I think you just reported that, and that there will be additional considerations for the board meeting, the board session in September with AGB. The board had previously established a housing committee of the board, and that meets regularly, and chaired by Trustee Van, Van Pinock, and they bring forth recommendations for any improvements. Yes, and that committee is very active. I appreciate that, Trustee Pinock. And then also, um, that's why we, that's why I wanted to go through this report in this meeting here, because I think it's just that critical. And also, uh, leaving the committees intact to carry on the progress for which we have now. Uh, number three was to further strengthen the board's overall effectiveness. The board will continue to work with the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, including its self-assessment process to enhance the board's operational effectiveness. And I encourage you, if you have questions as we go through this, to please ask them. Okay. So the Association of Governing Boards, AGB, was engaged by TSU to look at our governor's policies and practices, just assess the overall effectiveness of the board, and identify areas where the effectiveness could be enhanced. So as many may recall, AGB was previously engaged by TEC when the board, we, this local governor boards were established. And so we used the same uh, person who spearheaded at that time and spearheaded now. And so based on information gathered during that review, uh, she, they concluded the, that the board is operating effectively and in alignment with good government practices and with the recommendations by this consultant to provide the board with suggestions for achieving its goal of elevating its effectiveness. And so they're going to meet again, a scheduled a session uh, for September 13th of this year. And this is a, the, the session will include a follow-up to many of the items in their report. So we will redistribute their report to you long before the end so you can take another look at it. And then the board, she's going to, uh, Carol. Um, Cartwright. Huh? Carol Cartwright. Oh, Carol, okay, Carol Cartwright is, 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 is spearheading that. Okay, and that was September 13th. Yes. Would you all please go ahead and mark your calendar for September 13th, and uh, the administration will get to you the times. And that's the day before the September 14th board meeting, so it can be convenient for those that are coming in town. Okay. Uh, for the Board of Trustees hereby directs the TSU administration to provide an annual scholarship plan to the board and commencing the board's June 2023 meeting, present reports at the board regular meetings pertaining to the number and value of all scholarships offered and the number of signed scholarship acceptance offices. Offers. Notwithstanding the fact that a scholarship presentation will be made at the March 2023 meeting, the TSU's administration shall ensure that it provides a copy of the annual scholarship plan to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission for the academic years 2023-24 and 24-25. So the administration plan, the scholarship plan is is it was approved on March 16th, but we included the scholarship plan also in this June 15th board materials. And we're going to present that same scholarship plan, updated plan, to THEC uh, before the fall semester begins. We're going to update it, make it current, and then we'll send it to THEC. At, at one point, I, I remember seeing a document that said there's going to be biweekly reports or bimonthly reports to this body regarding scholarships and, and admissions and those kind of things. Is, is that a different? Um, what we said in the resolution was that we would just plan, we would present it to HIC, and we would just send it to the board. We did present one last time. My understanding is we will have an update on it and a representation of it uh, later on in the meeting here. We will. Uh, I just want to go through each item to make sure we are addressing each item in this resolution. Okay? So it will be, it will be forthcoming. 
The TSU Board of Trustees directs the TSU management to provide housing application and enrollment application data to the board, commencing at the board's June 2023 meeting and thereafter at its March, June, and September board meetings, notwithstanding the fact that an enrollment data report will be made at the March 2023 meeting. The TSU management shall also provide a copy of said housing and enrollment application data to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission for the academic years 2023, 24, 24, 25, and to the State Building Commission upon request. So the, 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 we're providing the housing application data. I think he just provided that to you with the 4368 beds and the plan for that. The enrollment application, that classification data, is in the materials that's going to come um, in the next report, the Finance Committee report. Six, the TSU Board of Trustees directs the TSU management to provide enrollment classification data to the board, commencing at the board's June 2023 meeting and thereafter at its March, June, and September board meeting, notwithstanding the fact that an enrollment presentation will be made at the March 2023 meeting. So the enrollment classification data for what we have as of June 13th, is we had 1,612 freshmen who, who that's enrolled. That includes both first-time freshmen and returning freshmen because all freshmen did not advance to the sophomore status. Sophomores, we have 1,576, juniors, 689, seniors, 669, then some transfers, readmit some others, 62. So total undergrad enrollment at this point as of June 13th was 4,608 and a graduate of 433, and the total enrollment as of June 13th was 5,041. I did check today, it's uh, 5,100, and I think it was 80. Okay, so we'll continue to get updates on yes. this as he enrolled. Okay. It, is, that, is that data, is that table in our, in our packet? No, that was in the President's report. Can, okay, because that, that's the it. kind of stuff that, that I thought we were asking for. Uh, well, more, in her report, I, and let me... And, and, and maybe I can confuse this just a little bit. I think it's critical that we make sure that we address each item of this memorandum. Yes. yes. So that's why I'm going through it. Now, that will be in her report. She okay. may have some additional details that she will bring forth when she makes the president's report. But I just want to go on record that we're looking at each one of these items in executive committee. Yeah, it, it was just my assumption that that, that kind of data was coming from uh, admissions and enrollment management in their report oh, through okay. uh, academic affairs or, uh, or in their section enrollment. of this. Okay, then, so we, can we make a note to make sure we include it in that report next time? Thank you. Uh, Attorney Pendleton. We'll be doing some enrollment, enrollment information in the budget finance committee. Okay, very there. good. So we'll okay. be some There's pretty, good. pretty detailed information in enrollment. In there. Very okay. Thank you. So I, just want to make sure, I just want to make sure we have that, that type okay. of data. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, the TSU Board of Trustees is committed to ensuring that TSU management has sufficient and appropriate personnel to operate TSU in a productive and efficient manner. And to that end, hereby directs President Glover to conduct a review of personnel, including but not limited to organizational structure, performance, and staffing within units, and present a personnel action plan, which shall include a plan of action for fulfilling all vacant and interim positions to the board at this June 2023 meeting. So in response to that, uh, we hired the, the new chief operating officer that you introduced at the early part of the, today, who's going to work with, uh, with the, the cabinet level members and with me to conduct this personnel review. And it's going to include the organization structure, the staffing, the performance of the units. And it's also going to take the lead in drafting the personnel action plan in consultation with the, the, the cabinet level personnel. Okay, thank you. Is it possible for all of the trustees to have a list uh, and a presentation of the uh, organizational chart sent to them by my email or by snail mail and even though I know it has to be public record but at least we will have an opportunity to review who's reporting to who 
who falls in which category as we stand now. Is that possible? Oh, absolutely. You did get, uh, we did update the org chart, but it's still, it's not complete yet because we still got some more offers and we still, uh, we want to give this chief operating officer a chance to take a look at the personnel where we are and to get the recommendations together. And it should be done probably by the end of sometime next month. That's fine. And if it has to be adjusted and reset every 30 days, fine with that. But the bottom line is we need to know exactly who's doing what and who's responsible for what, just in case we need to ask you to speak to someone regarding their particular position. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, that's very important that we know who is reporting to whom. And uh, I think that if there is a vacant position, it's still going to report to someone. We indicate that. And rather than, I, I think, it's saying sometime next month, let's say that by uh, the, July 31st, that this report will have been sent out to the um, Board of Trustees. And that after that, if there's changes to be made, as Trustee Lewis uh, indicated that, it, that there be updates made. Okay. All right, thank you. And then we talked about the interim positions. Uh, there's been some discussion about we had some interim positions. Well, there were six interim deans. There are now three interim deans. So we have active searches for two of the remaining three. One is the College of Business and one is College of Engineering. And the other dean is out on sick leave. The department chairs, there were nine interim department chairs, and eight of the nine have now been filled. And assistant, and associate deans, there were five associate or assistant deans, and all five have now been filled. Will we, in your report later on, get some additional details in terms of um, who's was hired, et cetera? Right here. Okay, very good. <laughs> all right, so number eight, the TSU Board of Trustees further directs President Glover to retain in an exp expeditious manner a Chief Operating Officer, a Director of Construction Management, or similar title position, and conduct an in-depth review of the enrollment management operations. Good. Thank you. Jason Evans, who <laughs> we introduced earlier, was hired as Chief Operating Officer, and he'll begin his employment on June 26th. He's here today. He doesn't officially start uh, the TSU employment until June 26th. And that may have been adjusted, but right now that's what we have on the record. So Will Rayford, Will Rayford, I think he came in. He may have stepped out with this one, okay. Was hired as Director of Construction Management and began his employment on May 1st. And then Jessica Powell, who's here also, is Assistant Vice President for Customer Relations. I heard employment earlier this month. So what we'll do, I... I um, sent you, I sent everybody a list of all the new employees in a memo form. Mm -hmm. So I will update that and then attach that organization chart. Okay. All right. When Mr. Raffer comes back in, would we please remind me so that we can introduce him uh, each time we attempted to, he wasn't here, okay? All right, good. Number nine, the TSU Board of Trustees directs TSU. <laughs> <laughs> It's your board. <laughs> it is. The TSU Board of Trustees directs TSU management to present to the Finance and Budget Committee for its prior approval specified financial budget changes that exceed 10%, including scholarships, and directs TSU management to present to the board for its approval a policy consistent with this directive. Uh, Vice President of Business Finance, Doug Allen, has been directed to Request approval for any expenditure that meets or exceeds 10% of the approved budget effective July 1 budget period. The any adjustments beyond this threshold have to be reviewed by the president or the COO prior to the request for the approval. And they will be submitted to the board at the following board meeting as an agenda item. If an emergency request is warranted, the board chair will communicate to the board and obtain approval. And the policy is being developed as we speak. Okay. Um, Ten, the TSU Board of Trustees, in concurrence with the Comptroller's report, shall take all appropriate measures, including having this board special committee on housing, work closely and expeditiously, expeditiously with TSU management to add at least two new residence halls to the university's housing inventory. Okay. 
So we will continue to work with TBR and do all the necessary planning that we've been doing and with the state architect that will include the two residence halls. And we want to bid on the agenda for the for consideration for the State Builder Commission in July. So we just we said we're excited that the, the staff have been assigned to help express this process, the staff at TBR to and we're 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 hopeful we can get on the agenda in July. Item 11, the TSU Board of Trustees hereby directs the TSU management to provide for at least the next two fiscal years a report at each board meeting addressing the university's practices and responsiveness regarding student-related communications, including in the areas of enrollment, housing, and financial aid. So we have the communications plan that will be presented to you. Um, I said was because it's for the 2 o'clock session. And then we also had a new Office of Customer Relations. We, we mentioned Jessica Powell. It's been established. It's been staffed of four individuals. Uh, the Assistant Vice President for Customer Relations. And her team will assist communications by providing this more centralized approach to ensure that students and their parents receive that, that, that there's more a timely response and answer their questions as, as needed. So do we already have those four individuals that that office is going to be staffed with? We already have those on? Yes, we have the Assistant Vice President, Jessica Powell. We have um, Dr. McPhee, who is the director. No, she's Assistant Director. And then we have um, Sierra Walker who is an uh, employee over there. So we're gonna have a, she's gonna get one more person. Okay, so we only have one more needed. Um, 12, the TSU Board of Trustees through its respective board committees shall monitor and review adherence to the directives and matters contained in this resolution and directs TSU's management to present a report at its quarterly meetings updating the board on TSU's adherence to the directives contained in this resolution. Good. So what we're doing now is present this report today to just show that we are adhering to the board's resolution items, and then that's going to and what we'll, we determine what needed to assist and monitor your monitoring roles. So that's, yeah. that's the purpose of this today. Yeah, so we are adhering to that, and uh, we, we need to make that a part of the exec committee meeting as we go forward. Turn to Pendleton, okay? Can I make one comment? Yes, sir. For VP Allen, we'll yes, work sir. together. Um, the, the intent of the budget variance, the 10%, is a materiality issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not interested in a $200 variance, but we're very interested in a, <laughs> if we're going to have a scholarship or an issue that'd be a two or three million dollar variance. So even if it's not a 10%, I would I would also, as you as you put the policy together, I heard you're putting a policy together, try to figure out a way to put a materiality issue in there mm -hmm. so that you, when, when you have something that comes up, maybe nine and a half percent, but it's still a lot of money, you would interact with the chairman of the finance committee or, or mm -hmm. communicate that with the president. I don't want to have something that kind of just gets approved because it's less than 10% if it's a material issue. No, because I think that was the spirit of that discussion, Agreed. that we would want to understand that. So I just comment as you're putting that policy together, it's a good time to, to kind of include Thank that. You. If you Thank you. Thank you. I have one observation, and I want, would like to have this cleared up in my mind, and that is our relationship with the TBR currently. Lawrence. Yeah, so if you recall, uh, Trustee Lewis, a, f a few years ago, so when the FOCUS Act first came into being, um, the institutions that were part of the TBR severed from the TBR and, and established their own governing boards. There were a, a number of areas, though, that there would be, uh, the TBR would maintain um, some sort of overview or relationship with the institutions on. Um, one was uh, procurement. Uh, we went through a process to sever from the TBR on that. Then, then there was an area of construction management. And so the construction management, the board, and I want to say, time flies, well, two years ago, approved for the severance of uh, TSU from the TBR. However, at that time, um, with the staffing situation, uh, you have to get approval through THAC to actually sever. And so um, the former vice president for business and finance had been working on that. 
and now um, VP Allen is working with the TBR and as part of the hiring of Mr. Radford as well as other individuals I know will be presenting a plan to, to THAC to seek for the severance uh, at the appropriate time. So for purposes of constructive management, currently TSU still works with the TBR on that and VP Allen minus some additional words. Now let me ask again, make sure it is my, uh, I just heard, I think, that uh, VP Allen will, is in the process along with Mr. Rayford and others to separate TSU from the TBR regarding the construction management. Is that the case? Yes. And what is the ETA on this? So this process, uh, Trustee Lewis, uh, that could be a six month to a year process. Uh, right now, first and foremost, we had to get the right folks on board. So it's a, literally a checklist of items that we have to uh, go through uh, to ensure the sever, uh, severing of the uh, partnership or relationship with the TBR. So we're hoping to do that in six months. We currently have, again, Will Rafford on staff. Uh, he's been instrumental. He's actually uh, worked with several other individuals at TBR. Uh, so this has provided us some additional footing and uh, knowledge and expertise that we desperately needed uh, in that role. Uh, we also have an architect. Uh, I know he's actually in the process of interviewing and hiring an architect on staff. We also uh, hired a new draftsman. So these were positions that we needed uh, in order to move forward. So I think this process will, will move fairly quickly now that we have those individuals. Can you tell me where this checklist came from? Yes, this is a checklist that actually TBR provides. Uh, this was provided to each institution, uh, each of the LGIs as well. So this is actually the last uh, piece of work that we have uh, with TBR. Once we can sever, uh, it, it is believed that we can speed up our construction projects by six months to even a year in some cases, depending on the size of the project. And it is my understanding we have not hired the architect yet is that correct? So I wanted to allow uh, Will Rafford to come on board first uh, so, uh, to make a determination for his staff. Uh, literally week one, he started into that process. Uh, so we should have someone hired here within the next, I'd say within the next two to three weeks. And who's going to hire the draft person? We already have the draft person. <coughs> we hired that person uh, back in May. So therefore we only short one category of the architect. Is that correct? For the critical positions that for the are needed critical. for the severance, yes. Thank you for bringing me up to date on that. Yes, sir, you're welcome. And now the executive committee is up to date, and I'd like to have a report in our next board meeting on this particular subject so we'll know where we stand. Sure. Yes, could we make that an ongoing report? I'd appreciate that too, okay. Madam Chair. And just a point of clarification, Trustee Lewis, that the checklist that's referenced. Ultimately, it's THAC that makes the determination that we have the sufficient structure and staffing in place to warrant severs from the TBR. TBR does not make that call. Mm -hmm. Am Thank I you. correct? Thank also? you so very much for that information. Am I correct also that we have not severed um, the data integrity piece, right? We're still tied to their data set. Is that correct? That's, that's still a joint Yes, that's my understanding. Tim Warren, all the institutions, I believe, are still a part of that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I didn't hear you, Tim Warren. What did you say? That again? Tim, I was, I was referring to Tim Warren for IT. It's more of the IT area. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Warren, do you have any comments you'd like to make on that subject? No, it's just, it's just the TBR aggregates all of our data and then you know, reports it over to Tim Warren. It's a consistency thing, right? Is that correct? For those of you who maybe did not hear, he said TBR aggregates all of our data. I don't think he has a mic over there. Yeah, and meaning all all of the all former TBR universities. <clears throat> okay. All right, that ends the items that were on the um, resolution. I think this gives us a prime opportunity to be able to um, discuss individual items and request things that we need to see and I appreciate your comments. I thank you very much for bringing it up 
during the executive committee session. Thank you. Spider issue that's causing our line to drop here, so I need to mm. log it back on. Okay, um, let me just let's give you just a uh huh. I'm sorry. No. Let me give him just a couple of minutes to get that back on because the next item that we're going into, I think, is very important for all uh, board of trustee members to be able to uh, hear. Who's our internet provider? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, maybe we need to change. I was just thinking that. I, I'm sure Mr. Warren will investigate this and 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 give us a report as we go along. <clears throat> yes, it is. Mr. Warren, while you're doing that, I'm going to recommend, and I know you said we have three, so if we need five, we need to get five, but we need to evaluate these providers. Uh, this is, I mean, I know you're not the provider, but this is totally embarrassing. Uh, so we need to make sure we look into this. Okay, he said we're changing phone providers also. So, what's the um, ETC on that? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I'm sidetracked. Okay, the next item on the agenda is an update on personnel. This is, an, this is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. President Glover, please provide a report on personnel. I think I went over yes, quite a few of them, but I'll just tell you. Um, uh, well, that's basically it. <laughs> I was just saying, I'm, I'm drilling a little bit more on the, on the COO. The COO is going to assist us a lot with the, the, the bread and butter operations and, and, and missions uh, and recruitment. Um, uh, digital and both regional recruiting, the scholarships, the registrar, data management, IT, first year students, first year advising, just various other operations. And you can see it's going to be heavily involved in enrollment management and operational improvements. Then it's going to handle the customer service, the customer relations aspect. We've staffed the customer relations as we said earlier, so the COO is going to be this is going to make the decisions. We're going to give him the ability to make decisions and bring in the right people he needs to bring in. So those in internal audit is going to report to him. Of course, you, as, you, as you mentioned to me, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, the internal audit always has that dotted line to the chairman of the audit committee of the board and to the president. Uh, also, IT will report to the COO. And... So then the others, I think I've told you, I went over all the details of the others we brought in um, who've been hired or introduced them in earlier in the one the meeting, in one of the charts. So, do you think? Probably, I think it was maybe a couple of years ago, Mr. Uh, it was probably a couple of years ago, Mr. Lewis made a comment that uh, we needed to make sure that we make arrangements, VP Alton, <clears throat> to have all the necessary personnel that we need to get the job done. You sure did. <clears throat> I would like to just reiterate his comment, make sure that we have all the personnel that we need to get the job done. Yes. Okay, are there any further comments? Okay, the next item on the agenda is, I'm sorry. Oh yes, I'm sorry, uh-huh. That's okay. Uh, just, just one uh, thought. I know that as we add uh, personnel that we need, um, there's also an eye to make sure that our administrative costs are 
uh, don't exceed our instructional cost, or at least they stay in line with our instructional cost. So BPI will be uh, in good stead in relation to those two numbers. I apologize. Can you repeat that? With respect to adding additional administrative personnel, I know there's always a concern that our administrative costs uh, are not out of line with our instructional costs. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are we keeping an eye, keeping our eye on the ball in that regard? Absolutely we are. And you'll see in some of the budget documents that uh, the majority of the budget or a larger percent of the budget is directly uh, going to instruction. So we do not uh, decrease the instruction budget. We actually increase that. But we do monitor and, and make sure that any operational costs will not inc uh, exceed instructional cost. That's exactly. Thank you. And I just had a comment that she is also going to um, go over the comptroller's report and resolution again this evening because this one is um, voice that we can hear, but it is not uh, video stream. So we want to make sure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to um, understand exactly what we are doing. Uh, set the next item on the agenda is the secretary's report. Secretary Pendleton, please provide your report. Thank you, Chair Cole, the other members of the board. Um, just want to adjust a few items. The uh, Under the FOCUS Act, the faculty senate is charged with the um, authority to appoint the faculty trustee to a two-year term, and the faculty senate completed that process and re-elected trustee Bill Johnson for a two-year term uh, that commences officially on July 1st, 2023. So, um, congratulations. Thank you. Also, with the student trustee, as we know, the board is charged with the authority to approve um, uh, a student trustee to serve a one-year term. The process that we have had since our inception uh, has been for um, the SGA to bring forward um, some candidates, some applicants for the position, and that being reviewed um, by myself and some other members in administration, and then forwarded on to Dr. Glover for her consideration and her recommendation. So that recommendation will be going forward uh, today uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Sean Wimberly, who is currently our student trustee. Mr. Wibberley has done an excellent job. We really appreciate the input that he's given us. Uh, Secretary Pillington, and I may be overlooking it, but I don't see on my sheet where we go into executive session. So that is a part of audit committee. Audit. We do it in audit, not in executive. Okay, very good. That's fine. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> is there any additional... Uh, Business. Actually, just a couple other, a few other additional items. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no problem. So, one, I want to thank everyone for providing your conflict of interest forms. I can okay. say today we officially have them all turned in. Um, so, that is very helpful and is consistent with our, our policy that uh, we had modified a couple of years ago. That's one violation we won't, that's one violation we won't have this time. Yes. It won't be a repeat. We, yes. We, we continue to... Make sure that those are in by the time frame that we've set in under the uh, board's um, um, policy. Also, uh, we have continued to keep, keep you updated on the sunset process that was during the legislature, the last legislative session. It's the first session of the um, uh, 113th um, General Assembly. And during that, as we uh, had commented to you, uh, if you recall, initially, the evaluation, the Joint Evaluation Committee, so it's a Joint Government Operations Evaluation Committee that's made up of both House members and Senate members, uh, initially voted for the Board of Trustees for a one-year renewal. Then the House took up the measure, and the House Government Operations Committee voted for the Board for a two-year renewal. And that bill was went over to the Senate 
and the Senate considered it its own potential reorganization or renewal, ultimately the Senate declined to take really any action. And so where we're at now is January 9th, I believe, is the commencement of the new, the second session of the General Assembly. And the General Assembly has the opportunity to pick that back up and to consider that in terms of the extension for the board. Uh, if there is no action taken, then by June 30th of 2024, the board would end and cease in its operations. Um, so from that perspective, again, the General Assembly still has the opportunity. In fact, they can pick up the bill that the House had actually approved, um, or it can do, look to do some sort of modification with respect to that legislation. So can I ask a question? Um, in regards to the board, if there is no action taken and you're moving forward for the two years, does that mean the two people that were up? So with your two, so when you talk about our appointments of individual members. Yes. Okay, so, so. there, if, if you're, you're already on the board and the governor can then reappoint, if and that's subject to the confirmation of the General Assembly. If the General Assembly does not act on that, then that would continue. You'd be considered a holdover so that you're continuing, your appointment continues um, until the General Assembly would take some form of action on your appointments. So, again, you're deemed to be, continue to be members um, because you've been already appointed by the governor. Uh, and your terms would then be considered either holdover. Um, there's some question as to whether or not the governor actually pulled the appointment, but nonetheless, you would still be holdovers under the Focus Act and still be um, official duly members of the, of the board. With the opportunity for the General Assembly to take action again, and just, uh, I have some information here with respect to, there are no other board members that would be up in 2024. So, for example, Trustee Cole's term ends in June 2025. Um, Trustee uh, Pinnock, 20, June 2026. Trustee Andre Johnson, June 2025. Trustee Lewis, June 2025. Um, Trustee McKenzie, June 2026. Uh, Trustee uh, Walker, June 2026. Remember, originally, we had the staggered terms when the Focus Act and you were initially appointed. Uh, and then one other item that we've mentioned already, but just again, another reminder, there will be the session on September 13th uh, with AGB consultant Carol Cartwright will be coming out here um, for that session. So again, you can mark your calendars on that. And that concludes my report. Is there any additional, I'm sorry, oh, okay. Is there any additional business? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. So the, moved. <clears throat> any discussion? Hearing none, the question is on the motion to adjourn the meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Trustee Lewis. Aye. Trustee Martin. Aye. Trustee Walker. Aye. The motion is approved. We are adjourned. All right. The June 15th, 2023 Audit Committee is now called to order. At this time, we need to make certain, do we need to make those findings, Attorney Pendleton? Yes. Okay. At this time, we need to make certain findings for necessity to conduct this meeting by electronic participation without the physical presence of a quorum. Findings for necessity for conducting the committee meeting without the phys physical presence of a quorum. In accordance with Tennessee Code Annotated Section 844108B2, as chair of the audit committee, I offer the following facts and circumstances in support of a finding of necessity for the Board of Trustees Audit Committee to conduct its June 15, 2023 meeting without the physical presence of a quorum. 
The audit committee is scheduled to take up important committee matters, which require timely action by the committee, including, but not limited to, approval of the fiscal, fiscal year 2023-24 audit plan. The committee will also hear important reports on internal and external audit items, outstanding audit issues, and the audit office's internal quality assessment. Participation by electronic means is necessitated by members in person absence due to unavoidable travel issues. Accordingly, I move that the committee find that participation by a quorum of the committee members by electronic means of communication is necessary. Is there a second? Second. The question is on the motion to find that participation by a quorum of the committee members by electronic means of communications is necessary. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Chair McKenzie, Trustee McKenzie. Aye. And Trustee Aye. Pinnock. Aye. Aye. Okay. The motion carries. We will proceed with the meeting with the quorum present. Okay. So now we need to call the roll for the committee, Secretary Pelson. Yes, Chair Cole. Aye. Here. Trustee McKenzie. Here. And Trustee Pennant. Present. Okay. Uh, all right, committee members, if you cannot hear or speak to the other committee members or board members, please state so now. For each committee member participating electronically, please identify any individuals who are present in the location for which you are participating. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the March 16, 2023 Audit Committee meeting minutes. The minutes of the Audit Committee March 16, 2023 meeting are included for your review in the board material for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I move for the audit committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 audit committee meeting minutes as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 audit committee meeting meeting minutes as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Trustee McKenzie. Aye. Trustee Pennock. Aye. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the annual report on the audit office's audit activities. Information regarding this audit committee agenda is included in your board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I am asking President Glover or his designated personnel to provide pertinent information related to this agenda item. This is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. Thank you. As you know, Adrian Davis has served as our Director of Internal Audit, and she did um, uh, take a job um, with a fan. Well, she took a job in Birmingham, but she has agreed to to come on board for this meeting to walk us through where we are. Uh, she on the phone yet, Doctor? I mean, Lars. No, I don't believe so. Are you on, uh, Miss Davis? Yes. Okay, good. I've also asked uh, our new director of internal audit to why don't you come to the table to uh, to be here in case she wants to chime in. She's read through the. The reports also. So now uh, it's okay. I'm gonna ask Miss Davis. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Davis. Okay. So this agenda item is required by the Institute of Internal Auditors and by the Audit Committee Charter that we discuss the audit office and annual activities with the audit committee. The report included documents those items that were completed during the year, and for those audits that included audit findings. Those um, areas are included on the proposed audit plan for follow-up to determine the current status of those reported findings. There are two items in the report that have not been discussed, and that is the internal audit quality assessment. That's a separate agenda item today, and a follow-up report for the uh, of Tennessee Financial and Compliance Audit of the University for fiscal year 2021. That report is also included in your materials. It's a required follow-up that has to occur whenever there's a report that has a finding. You have to issue a follow-up report. 
The report for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2021, did include an unspotified opinion, but there were three repeat findings. The first finding was in the area of uh, bank reconciliations not being timely and complete. At its November 17, 2022 board meeting, the TCU Board of Trustees did approve a revised bank reconciliation policy. And we obtained the bank reconciliations prepared by the university and the foundation for fiscal year 2023 through April 2023. So we requested the bank reconciliations for July 2022 to April 2023. For the university, we did find where the reconciliations were being prepared within 30 days of the prior month end. There were minor differences on each of the reconciliations. It ranged from a negative $1,800 to a positive $200 but we did find that they were being timely prepared. There wasn't a difference to the July 22 bank reconciliation that occurred in August and November, but the others were within the month's end and there were no additional adjustments. For the foundation bank reconciliations for July 2022 to April 2023, we found that each of the reconciliations had been subsequently adjusted and the latest adjustment occurred in May 2023. Those reconciliations, they included a difference of $1,837 that re related to previous years. That amount was unreconciled difference for the reconciliations prepared during the year. Do you have any comments on that first finding, or should I go to this? Uh, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Williams, if you would, uh, after each item, if you have any comments that you would like to make, would you please do so? I do have one uh, question. I'll make sure I understood you, that the bank reconciliations mm -hmm. are being uh, performed on a timely basis, and your last review went through April of 2023. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, and if you have any comments, please make, please make them after each item, then I don't have to repeat it each time. I just have a question about the foundation reconciliations on page 51 the dates um, where I see the month July 2022 you have prepared 8 12 2022 reviewed 8 20 2022 then right under these that you also have 9 23 2022 and then it goes on 1 5 2023 can you please explain that I can respond yes. to that. The reconciliation. Oh, oh uh, Alex would better explain it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, yes, uh, Director of Internal Audit. <clears throat> what you see there is uh, the reconciliations were uh, performed because there were adjustments made due to prior period adjustments. So we wanted to make sure that we captured and showed transparency that each of the uh, each of the uh, uh, reconciliations were performed each month as they were required to per, per the board policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you saw multiple dates there, that was because <clears throat> two reasons. One, um, well, three reasons. The external audit is just was a little bit behind, so that puts us behind, okay? But that's not an excuse. That's just where we are right now. Secondly, uh, we had the opportunity that we shared with uh, our external auditors that we knew we had prior period adjustments that were impacting current year activity. So we had to at some point put a line in the sand and show, uh, and again, the, the auditors can attest to this, they went through and looked at 100% of the transactions to note that it was not a current year issue, that it was a prior year issue that had already been taken. So uh, for full transparency for the board, that's why we wanted to show each time that the reconciliation had to be revised. Okay, adjustment. Okay. I want to ask a question. That question is, um, as I read in here, there were corrections to the July 2022 20, bank reconciliation in subsequent months. And I know there were some that were before. So what I want to make sure that I'm going on record to say that mm -hmm is that the reconciliation, and correct me if I am incorrect, the reconciliation process in order to bring the items current, mm -hmm. the fact that it had not been done for some time would allow for there to be corrections made uh, in a current in period for something that related to yes. a prior 
right. uh, year. Am that I is, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, continue, please. I have a question. Yes. It's Tusky, shut up, uh, On page uh, 50, and, and I remember correctly, but... I couldn't hear what, pa what page was that, sir? Page, page 50. Okay. At the top, uh, it talks about our reconciliation time frame, moving from 60 days to 30 to 40 days. Did we tighten that down to actually 30 days, or did we leave it at 30 to 40? I, I'm not remembering. Uh, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, I'll respond to that. Uh, the board approved uh, a 30-day reconciliation after month end, okay? Uh, and it also approved 45 days at the fiscal year end as we do the wrap. So 6-30-2023, we technically have until August 15th. And that's very standard, very normal through the closing process. Uh, and we've met each of those uh, requirements of 30 days and we were actually doing that sometime before the board even approved uh, that policy, but we wanted to be in line based on the recommendation from the comptroller's office. Uh, and thank you, uh, Trustee Pinnock, for that question. Very good question. I think that what we need to do is correct this because first thing, I don't like time frames from something to something, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think we're very specific in the 30 days after Monday and 45 days after fiscal year end. And so, that's, yes, ma'am, that's what's actually in, in the, policy. the policy. Very yes. good. Yes, yes. Okay. You need to need, in the minutes, Secretary Pendleton, if you please make sure that we state that we identified the specific policy for the reconciliations. Please continue. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Please continue. The second finding related to uh, breakdowns and controls that resulted in errors in the financial statement and the university management has ensured that they had the proper personnel in place with the adequate knowledge of gaps to complete the financial statements and they were timely submitted and reviewed prior to their submission. And this issue is also was um, related to the bank reconciliation and the time in it and the area also has been addressed. The underlying call also fine to Okay. The third finding related to our accounts receivable collection and that issue has not been completely addressed. We are in the process um, the office of the birth saw of automating that process for billing they anticipate a late June, early June slash start to the automation of the billing process. They've also restructured the office. There are three new positions that report directly to the bursar. They include an elections manager that started on June 1st, 2023, an accounting manager that's currently in place, and they will have the position for the customer service manager this fit in the new fiscal year beginning in July. Okay, tell so me. that issue is... Who does the office of the Bursar report to? To whom? Okay. So, VP Allen. Yes, ma'am. Please, we need to make sure that this gets addressed. You said prior for audits. So, whatever we need to do to get this corrected, uh, please make sure that we do so. Okay? And, Secretary Pendleton, if at the end, if you would because I have to go back while they're talking and look at these minutes from before. Would you please make sure at the end of each committee meeting minutes, there is a list of items to be followed up on for the next meeting, please. Yes, sir. Um, if we wait till August, will this repeat as a finding uh, as we pass the fiscal year? Well, if, if the odd and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, right now the audit that's being done was for June 30th, 2022. Correct. So now the fact that it's not corrected right now, and if it doesn't, it, when we get to June 30th, 2023, yes, it is going to be uh, a repeat finding, even, well. And, and that's one thing I do want to point out. This finding, okay, due to timing, has been corrected, yes. okay? So you will see that in the FY23 audit. If we received our audits in a more timely fashion, that allows us then to make that change and then the audit should be able to report on it. So we're still lagging anywhere from nine months to 12 months just due on timing. But as I stated in previous meetings, yes, this, this uh, particular finding has been corrected. 
<laughs> but it will be a repeat finding in the 630 2022 22. audit that they are conducting now, as VP Allen said, due to the lag in preparation right. or conducting those particular audits. So we need to go on record, making sure we all understand that. Now, what we have to, I think, stress to the auditors that are here, which doesn't mean they're going to change it, but they can make a note that it has been corrected. And thank you for getting that Absolutely. Done. Can this go live July 1st or June 30th to get it completely off the books? So again, uh, when you say in July 1 of 2023, Three. correct? Correct. Yeah, so it's all, that's what I'm saying. It's already corrected. Okay. We were already moved into this particular process. For example, what we did um, in revamping the process, we, we actually sent the file. Uh, this was the write-off of, of student receivables. Okay, We hadn't done that in the last five years. Uh, so we worked through that process with, uh, that was with the Department of Finance. That uh, we went back and forth. They had additional questions as they do with all institutions. We answered those questions and they came back and said, okay, uh, we're now ready to move it to the comptroller's office for their review and sign off. So to answer your question, you'll see it fall off in, in 2023. Um, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to clean the, clean the document here. Yes. Okay. And so if this document was amended to say June 30th, 2023, right, mm -hmm. there'd be nothing for them to refer to that extends into that next fiscal year. That is correct. Once they start the 2023 and audit. Can, can we do that with this document, please? What exactly are you asking? I'm not sure I understand. They're anticipating a June, July 2023 start for the automated billing process. If this read a June 30th mm -hmm. start for the automated billing process, that would mean we would start the new fiscal year without a doubt that this is in place. So that's already in place now. Then, so then we could, we could correct this language. Not June, July, but June 30th. I see no reason why we couldn't do that. Okay. Please get, make so note in the, in the in minutes for the correction. Thank you. Okay. Um, would you continue, please? That concludes my uh, report. Uh, okay. Uh, did we go over the... Okay, we concluded that one. Do you do you have another report? Yeah, it's the next agenda item. Okay, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, next agenda item. Let's see. Okay, the next item on agenda is to report on internal and external audit items. Information regarding this audit committee agenda item is included in your board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I am asking President Glover or her designee Native personnel to provide pertinent information related to this agenda item. This is an information discussion item. No voters required. Um, <clears throat> President Glover. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Avery, you continue. In March of 2023, the Division of State Audit released a single audit report. The Tennessee State University CARES Act funding was audited as a major program. There was a finding documented related to the CARES Act funding. They had question costs for the institutional portion of our CARES Act funding of $8 million. They had a range of question costs for the HERF HBCU funding from $9 million to $15 million. The finding as documented state at Tennessee State University did not discharge student debt within federal guidance or their own internal policy and scholarship determinations and award calculations were not adequately documented in compliance with federal guidance for higher education emergency relief funds. One of the criteria they used was the frequently asked questions that's um, dispersed by federal guidance. In there, it states that universities cannot condition the discharge of student debt, i.e. it cannot be based on continued enrollment. In documentation, for the provided to the students, it was stated that if they re-enroll for the fall 2021 semester, they would be eligible to have their student debt relief for the COVID-related semesters, which would be March 2020 through the summer of 2021. 
So one of the areas of the finding is stating that because the discharge was based on the condition of re-enrolling in the fall, it was not allowable. Also, the communications that the auditors had stated that if they re-enrolled in the fall, they could have their debt discharge for the period March 20 through the summer of 2021. It did not include the fall of 2021. However, their testing, they noted that they found that 73% or $14 million of the amount discharged for the 2023 fiscal year related to the fall 2021 semester. Another area of the finding was in the area of documentation. It was stated that the university had not documented its methodology for awarding students and how they were determined, how the award amounts were calculated. And a third aspect, it was noted that the HBCU her funds were overspent to the tune of $7 million. To correct this, the university transferred $5 million to the institutional her account and $1.2 million was transferred to the institutional grant fund account. The university provided a lengthy response to the finding where they noted that they did not feel that the university was in noncompliance. They actually spoke with the U.S. Department of Education Management and Program Specialist who stated that as it related to the question and cost, the university's account was in good standing. They also noted that there was no uh, overspending of the funds, but in fact this represented a transfer between her accounts. Okay, uh, and that's it for that report. Okay, I, I am totally confused on this. <laughs> okay, it was my understanding that we obtained um, information from the agency that the procedures that we implemented were in compliance. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, am I correct in that? Let me go first. You are correct in that. We're not sure what was going on with Arthur during that time. As you know, there was a lot of noise about TSU at, during that time period. There was also um, some, there was, there was noise. And so uh, when they came out here for that audit, we're not sure what their mindset was. There's no accusation of any type, but we just, we just weren't sure. So we did, um, we did take it a step further and talk to the Department of Ed. And I'll let uh, Mr. Mr. Allen, go and tell what was said, Department of Ed. Absolutely. So again, thank you, Madam President. I, I want to sum this up by saying, and, and Ms. Auditor Davis, I want to thank you for your comments as it relates to, uh, to the work you performed. Thank you. I gotta take this call. If you look on page 59 you. of your board materials, and I'm just going to read a segment here of our response, which I think is important. When the... Uh, the Comptroller's Office, when they came out to perform uh, the HERF audit, they only performed it on the HBCU portion, okay? That was the additional funding uh, that uh, the, the federal legislators provided to HBCUs, okay? It come into question, I'm going to read this here. It says here, we provided to the U.S. Department of Education Management Program Specialist the list of 4,576 students whose debt was discharged in the amount of $15.1 million. This is the exact same information that we provided to the state auditors. The U.S. Department of Ed uh, Education Management Program Specialist, which actually oversees the HBCU portion of the program. Okay, she is the main person out of the Atlanta office. Uh, stated here that uh, reviewed the documentation outlined and in indicated that regarding the $15 million as question cost, I have reviewed documentation requested and provided. Your account is in good standing with paying off student balances in the manner documented. And I think that's very, very important to note uh, once we had that conversation uh, with the program specialist, uh, there was follow-up with the uh, Comptroller's Office, and it was a matter of a difference of opinion. So I'm not saying that the, the uh, Comptroller's Office can provide what they want and and list what they want. I'm just saying that we took those additional steps to show that we were in compliance with the HERF guidance and guidelines in which the Comptroller's Office does this work on behalf of the U.S. Department of Education. So there was still uh, some disagreement there, okay? And that was straight from the individual that oversees the program. They reviewed our information and determined that what we provided to the auditors, this information was appropriate, correct, and we were in good standing as it relates to our HERF funds. Okay, did they put that in writing somewhere? 
who the auditors? No. Um, USDA. Yes, they actually sent. Um, they provided an email. This was her words in the email that she provided. And also, I want to know once the uh, USDOE sends out their final report, it will show that we were in compliance uh, the entire time. So uh, they should be releasing that here probably within the next month or two. Not for sure the exact date, but at the end of the day, we were in compliance. APL. Yes, sir. Uh, Trustee Pitt. Do you know uh, if the Comptroller's Office uh, even attempted to verify with DOE? Um, that would seem like a reasonable step to me. Uh, yes. So there were discussions. Uh, they actually spoke to the um, the attorneys with the USDOE, and uh, they they the attorneys basically told them that they can put what they want to put in the report as they see fit as the auditors. Okay, so there was discussions, and I do know that the our audit team actually reached out uh, to the program specialist as well. She provided them the same response that she provided us. Uh, but again, there was just that difference of opinion. And what was what's critical about this is that they they do the audit on behalf essentially of the the, the 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 federal government. And so when they talked to them, they said that they're in good standing. They you know we sent they sent us the same schedule. And we looked at it, and we are we are we're okay with it. We talked with them. And so when they told the artists that, and they still refused to change it. So we just moved on. Because we know in the end, when it's, it's a federal, it's the education department that makes the call. So if I understand correctly, we contacted the agency. Yes. They said we were in compliance. That's correct. That was reduced to writing in an email. Mm -hmm. That was presented to the auditors. That's correct. The auditors refused to accept the opinion of the agency. Am I correct so that is, far? That's correct. So they continue to include it in the report. Right. Okay. It's, is there any way around that? We that share. just doesn't make sense to me. We would share the email to the, with the board. No, but I, I think her question is, is, is a good one, and that is that, I mean, is there... We tried to resolve this with the Comptroller's Office uh, prior to them releasing the report. Uh, they would not change their stance on it. So we're not throwing stones at the uh, comptroller's office. It's just a matter of it's, it's, it's hard to justify when you know that the agency that provides the funding says you're in good, you're in good standing, and the state agency pretty much says you're not. Okay, so we, we tried several times. When you say we're times. in good standing, now I want to make sure you're another clear point. Mm -hmm. We didn't just say, are we in good standing? We sent them information substantiating the procedure that we that we implemented. Madam Chair, we sent all the support and documentation for all 4,567 students. We had them lined out what they were awarded, when they were awarded. We also sent them the information that Dr. Glover sends out, notifying the students of the HER funding that's available to them. And part of the comptroller's argument was that, oh, you didn't have a plan. HERF guidance and requirements does not require a plan, okay? It says that you are to distribute the funds on behalf of the students, and that's exactly what we did, okay? But this comment that they wrote doesn't say we didn't have a plan. They're saying we didn't follow the procedures. I still agree with Trustee Martin in that is there, I mean, they refused to change their report. Yes. Even based on what the agency said. Correct. So and there's we nothing was, we can do about that. So it's so nothing we, higher we, do not than, we just said we do not concur with your finding. That's all, from our standpoint, that's all we can do as the person being audited. So it's nothing higher than the comptrollers that you can go to. Not to, from the state Not in this state. No. no, Tennessee state law, the comptroller has a final word on quite a bit. And so this is one of the things that the comptroller's office can just conclude, can opine on, can conclude on. And there's nothing we can do about it except disagree with it in writing. That's what we've done. Can we attach the correspondence from the agency? I think we did, but we did. Yes, okay, we no, I'm just I'm, I'm they not have questioning it. They that talked to them and did. received it. Okay, let's so just make sure that we, mm -hmm. if there's nothing we can do in our response, I just think we should document 
or include everything we can. And we know this going to it'll get cleaned up in the end when they send their report to the to yeah, the them. U.S. Department it'll, of Ed will release it. It'll be their fine with the department. Okay. Well, you know, they're, they're behind their backlogs. But, but, but it'll, it'll be fine in the end. But just right now, we're just, yeah. oh, this just, this is just added, it's just additive. And so we're the, fine. The, the issue is, is we're not fighting with the U.S. TOE. We're fighting with the mm -hmm. Comptroller in, in Tennessee. And, and, and I so, don't want to use so, the word fight. Uh, they have their uh, yeah. right to their opinion. Correct. And we have the right to ours. And okay. our opinion was that per the her guidelines right. per the program specialist we were in compliance they audited the information right. let me be very clear usdoe audited our information okay mm -hmm. prior to and providing this response before the auditors released the a133 report mm -hmm. when is the end no, well, I want to remember that this was during COVID, and there was fun, there were funds given to uh, HBCUs. I don't think anybody had ever done this kind of audit before, and so I just said perhaps they were putting together some information that weren't quite uh, applicable applicable to us, and you know, because we when we met the standard that they required for all the six universities that got funding. Because you know there were two pots of money. One went to all the universities, and a separate mm -hmm. part went to yes. HBCUs. Right. So for the one went to all the universities, we were fine on that. But it's for ones with specific HBCUs that they wanted the same procedures. I think apply from that one. That's what we were trying to figure out. And we talked to the federal, to the governor. They said no, that wasn't that was totally different. You know, you know, like was it uh, applicable? Large, you remember about the grantee? You may want to make those comments. Yeah, in some ways we likened it to we get all kinds of federal grants. I mean, you just heard. Uh, Dean Reddy to talk about the $18 million that we're going to get. That comes in a grant form. You have to comply with the requirements of the grant. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then you can find yourself in trouble in terms of not receiving additional grant funds. So with this and the receipt of these funds, um, what they've indicated is that we're, you know, we're in compliance with the conditions of the grant, in essence. That's what and what the Comptroller's Office, though, is saying is that they're taking, a fur, I think, a step further and saying, that now you need to be not only be in compliance, you need to have a policy that sets forth your compliance. But in essence, there's no policy typically when you have all of these grants that you receive. You don't have a policy for each grant. Uh, you need to make sure that you are following and can establish and prove that you are following the grants requirements and guidelines. And that's what the federal agency ultimately examines and determining whether or not they want to issue additional funds to you down the road with respect to another grant. So they examine that. Well, when, and that, and that may be... the end? That's what I want to know. <laughs> when is it over? The grant or the... the with oh, when they look with at the, the comptroller's yes. office. They got to send it to the government. We don't know what their process is. It may take up months. It may take up to a year. We don't know how long it's going to take it. We don't know. Well, to, to Chair Cole's point... There is a difference between being in good standing and having distributed the monies according to policies. So let do me we, answer that. Can we, do we yeah, have the let, document let, that let says very, we complied with this policy? Let me be very clear. The state there, only the policy, there is no policy that's required to be followed. You know that. It's required that you follow the guidelines from HERF set by the USDOE. That's there's no policy required and, for And we have, we have their language from them saying we've complied with the guidelines. As I read, yes. Okay. So when the comptroller is referring to policy, this is something they were saying that we should have? We should have, but it, but was, it doesn't, it's, it's, not, not required. it's not required. It's just something they decided that should correct. be in there. Yes. So I guess, Secretary Pilton, my question is, would we be out of order or could I say be politically correct if we were to share this information with legislators? I know the information is out there for them to be able to see, but I, I feel like um, if we could actually make sure that each of them see it in a simple form, yes. each of them see this information. I think that's important versus them seeing the report from the comptroller and us responding. And, us responding. Right. and the comptroller and the governor are the only ones that actually see this. Because if I'm a legislator and I see this information and you decide that you want to say 
Tennessee State University should have a policy, and that is not the requirement. Someone should be speaking up. So uh, will we be out of order doing that? I mean, is that something that's possible? I, I, I... No, I think the, 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 the one, as Dr. Glover was mentioning, the official response came within the audit. So we say we do not concur. And that is public. That will be in there for also the legislators to see. However, going to your point, we can and do additional follow-up, and I'm sure Dr. Glover has probably spoken with some of the legislators to let them know a broader context and understanding, including, for example, the email from the Department of Education um, on what, how they're viewing this uh, in comparison to, again, this extra requirement, which you're saying is you gotta have a policy for basically each sort of grant award, in essence, that you're receiving. Yeah, so, the, so us being proactive as opposed to reactive uh, would be in our best interest. I, I think, and, and let me just make a comment based on one, my prior audit experience, audit experience, which was a long time ago, but my current employment in that I think it's important to understand that number one, when you get a grant mm -hmm. in the uh, notice of grant award, they will outline what you can use the monies for. That's and in then, the catalog. Of course, of there was, <clears throat> because where I work, we also got the COVID funding. Yes. <clears throat> and then there was the policy that, from the agency standpoint, that were related. So from an agency standpoint, you are either in line with the grant, which means you made expenditures in accordance with the grant, or you're not. From the, which I don't agree, I mean, it's not a point of agree, I just take exception to what they did from the standpoint of the auditors that came in, based on their auditing and their determining what should be best practices or what should be the policy, they have their opinion. I think we were very on point to say that we took exception to it. I just wanted to make sure that we provided as much documentation as we could with it so that when it gets to the legislators or whatever, they see that it is there. But based on everything I've heard here, we don't really have the power to make them change. Okay, so from years of experience, and in, in, in Mr. Lewis can also contest to this, they're going to write what they want to write. And we have to write our response to it and with the documentation. So. Uh, I, I don't like the procedure, but <laughs> yes, ma'am. To your point, I absolutely agree. They're going to write what they're going to write, yep. but the legislators are the ones that will make decisions, right. not the comptroller. They, and so their decision will be based upon that report and our response. If I, what I'm saying is if they don't see that, if they just hear what the comptrollers are saying, and if they don't take the initiative, the initiative to actually go in and look, which a lot of them don't, then they don't have that information. These are the people that are making decisions for Tennessee State University. So I'm not saying to try to change the report, I'm just saying to get the information to the right people so that they can I, see I totally, it. I totally agree with you, totally. And when one of the things that we are lacking is an aggressive communication strategy. It's Dr. McKenzie we, talking. We, re, we, re, we react rather than act. Yes. The policy is very clear. The policy is set by the grantor. That is the policy. And that should be communicated in writing to the legislators who are making a decision about our future, not for us to sit back and wait for that to be communicated yep. to the legislators by the controller and the controller only. So I totally agree with, with that comment. We must get more aggressive around our communication strategy. And on, Mayor, and on page 58, we did detail out in our response, and they, it's included in here how we're talking with VSDOE, 
and we sent everything to them. The auditors concluded we didn't have it out of control, but we talked to the OE and we and they have all the guidelines, the information they submitted. So we we spelled it out in a lot of detail here. So it could be, and it is included in here. So we reviewed the documentation. We took what they said and reduced the writing. It's, a, it's, it's quite a bit in here that we said to them. So we want you to know that we didn't just accept we just it. Oh, I think the comments you made were excellent. If, if I'm not out of order in my request, I would like to say, Dr. Glover and whomever else that, that you have here that deals with the legislature, could we make it an effort to bring forth this particular situation to the legislator to comply with what Trustee Martin is saying in terms of who makes the decisions. I think if we could take that additional step, and I think that addresses Dr. McKenzie's comment about being proactive rather than reactive. So if I am not out of order with that, that would be my request. In advance of the comptroller releasing this report? Yes. Yes. This is, uh, this is Andre Johnson. I think the important thing is that when it, when things are buried in pages of response, and it becomes monotonous. And I think the legislature don't necessarily take the time or the effort to go through all of this in detail. I think what is being said, and maybe we can think about this, things that are most important to highlight, maybe they should be done on separate communication items so that they get them separately and can clearly see that, and it's not buried in page 58 of the response. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Uh, great. Yes. Okay. I agree. Uh, uh, Trustee great. Johnson, I, could I just I'll take what you said and I'll put it on to the okay. end of what I said, and that? that when we correspond, we could communicate or getting the information to the attention of the legislat legislature that we pull out that on a separate document, not within a lot of pages. So, Dr. Uh, Glover, if you and your administration could handle that uh, and then give us a report at the next meeting. And oh. and, and as Dr. Uh, Johnson said, uh, we need to make yeah, sure we do this. Huh? Oh, uh, 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 Trustee Martin, uh, would you work with them? She wants you, she requests you work with them on it. And in accordance with what uh, Dr. Johnson said, we need to get that out as quickly as, as, as we can. I do okay. want to state, uh, Dr. Johnson, you mentioned before the report goes out, this report's already been distributed. Okay. Not, oh, that's true. not to the uh, legislator. I don't know if yeah. they have. Well, so, I don't know if they've provided to them. I can't speak for yeah. Comptroller Mumpower. Well, let yeah. me say, let's get it out as quickly as possible. Okay? It, it's, I, cer it's certainly a lesson learned about the uh, depth of preparation uh, uh, in reading material uh, on the part of the legislators. Yeah. Well, and we so just have we to be proactive to in that you can rest assured that that the Comptroller's Office or whomever, they have made their contacts to present what they have here. So we need to make our contacts to present uh, and in a separate document, as Trustee J Johnson uh, noted. Any other comments on this subject? Okay. Yeah, I have one. Uh, yes, Ms. Lewis. Um, it's my understanding that this report is already in the hands of a controller. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. The controller yes, actually can Then if that's the, the case, we need to have an addendum or an amendment to the report with the highlighted information that you just read to us and with what is said on page 58. The auditors are inaccurate in issuing this information, and we need to show them how the State Department has said that we are correct in the way that it is presented. That needs to be given to the controller. Uh, yeah. Trustee Lewis? Yes. Uh, so our response was already provided, as, as Madam President said. The response that we was provided in the report, so the report that went out that he issued has this information in it. What you have here is just a piece of the report. Okay, but but Vice Vice President Allen, where we're going now with it, and I understand exactly what you're saying. This was in the report, but to to tying in Trustee Martin Johnson and, and Johnson, what I'm saying is, could we not prepare another document, get it to the legislatures, pulling out this information is very well written on page 58. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I, again, I want to belabor it, but I'm going to belabor it because when everybody says they want to belabor something, they're going to belabor it. But um, 
have we have we I, I see all the things that were done here, but have we formally done our own internal audit with our new lead audit director to say here is the grant criteria and here's what we followed. And we but a more formal type play. Well, she may get her today. I'm just saying that somebody. <laughs> hey, congratulations! But but my point is, it does, does it strengthen us to say that we actually did a formal internal audit? Very good. And we looked at here's the criteria, here's what we did, yeah. and our internal auditors yeah. believe that we still. In other words, it's not just this back and forth dialogue. Well, and I'm a little bit. The other comment I'll make is so number one, that's important to me. Mm -hmm. Number two is. This all works as long as the higher ups above the specialists agree with us. So, so yeah, the question is, I think that will strengthen and help our communication to say we took it seriously. We had an internal audit that looked at these criteria, and that we are in good standing and is confirmed by an email. I feel a lot better if it was not just an email. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'd feel better. I'm on a roll. Sorry. Uh -huh. um, I'd feel better if it wasn't just an email. I'd feel better if it was a formal letter. And I know we're waiting for that, but. Right. I'm just saying that, you know, I think there's some well, way more we can do to strengthen our case. So, Trustee Corbier. Thank you what you're saying. Is required related to this finding? So, an uh, internal audit report will require it to be submitted related to this finding. Okay, but I'd like to take it one step further to tie in what you're saying. Could we not, and I know it costs money, but this is critical. This is our mm -hmm. life here. Could we not hire an outside firm to come in? And audit this. So, so let me add to that. We actually already had a independent CPA come in and look at this particular pr um, question that we had and looked at the program itself. So we've already been on top of. Did they issue a report? Uh, yes. Uh, Working on, it. and you will bring that report. Yes, to board. that is correct. Okay. So, thank you. Wish you had said that earlier, yeah. but but because so it's the important good thing to know is, that we we got to validate. About it right. Right. Yeah. Well, we can, not you, but we need to validate these things. So this is. You know, we have a target that people are fifteen million dollars. It jumps out at things, right. and, and it's a great talking point to bills to go to legislate. We've taken it seriously. We have a third. We have an outside auditor that's looked at it. We've done an internal audit because that's what Adrian is saying too. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. we have a really good team here that really understands the technical standards behind compliance and for natural reporting. And and I just want to say that uh, if you're looking at that, it appears that TSU mismanaged $15.1 million. That, that would be in the mind of most people, right? Uh, so we always make sure we do our due diligence when it comes to things like this. I don't care if it's $1 or $20 million. We make sure that we have the processes in place and that we adhere to the compliance. And I'll say this. As a CPA, I don't play with these numbers. And, and my profession, that, that's what I took an oath to, is to make sure that we're doing things right and doing them the right way, period. Uh, and I want to say that. But we took the necessary steps. We'll take that additional step to let the legislators know we were in compliance. We did the work according to what the U.S. Department of Education required us to do. And it's been validated by a third party. That is correct, term. yes. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we don't, we, I'm sorry. No, go on. We agree completely. That's why we have trust in the finance group to do the right thing. That's right. We're talking about a communication plan here. Though. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's different. Agreed. Right. 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 So we've yeah. got to make sure right. that we have the elements of all these things to say, woo. Right. The red flag, we've checked it out, internal audit, go from there. Thank so, you. And can I say that I think, oh, yeah, I Thank you. VP Allen, someone said that we need to be proactive in getting this information to these people. Let me tell you something, and we have to call a spade a spade. I'm very concerned about a letter that I received from the chairman of the board that came from an area in the State Department, do they run Tennessee State? Are they the last word? I have a concern about that letter, and it seems like it comes from the financial area, and we need to make sure that we stay proactive with the finance people and the same people that they report to. When somebody is after you, you have to be one step ahead of them at all times. Proactive on every item. Totally. totally. Now that's totally. what we need to do. I agree. One more thing. Like <laughs> Trustee Corbett, 
I agree with Trustee Lewis. And, and maybe in addition to once that document is sent out to the legislators, and I think we've discussed this before, we all have different relationships. There's nothing wrong with picking up the phone and calling the legislators and asking them if they have received this document and if they've reviewed it oh. and if they will share with the others. We might not have a relationship with all of them, but we can begin to touch them. That's part of the communication and making sure everybody sees the correct information here. It's on us to make sure that happens, not on them. If it's on them, we see what happens. And we need to make sure that our own legislator has a copy of all of this and that it is sent or given to him, please, V.B. Allen, yes, sir. make sure our own legislator, that person is responsible for representing Tennessee State University and its board of trustees. Yes, sir. Hey, um, any well, how, how, do we, how do we assure that this issue is not dropped? I think it's the most critical issue. It is not the fact that we haven't done the work. It is not the fact that it is not on page 58. But how do we sure that we have an action plan in place to be proactive rather than reactive with the people who are making a decision about our future, that being the legislature. How do we, uh, you know, how do we know who, who's responsible for talking to what legislator? Do we have a list of the legislators that are going to be making the decision? Do we have people assigned to each legislator with a telephone number and an email, okay, that we can specifically target our communication strategy to the people who have the decision-making authority. How do we plan? Do we, do, does this need a, a vote? I mean, we, we talk about this, and then there's nothing. We come right back with another, uh, the same situation where, in fact, we've done our work. We're being attacked, but we don't have a proactive strategy for communicating to the people who need to know. Uh, Dr. McKenzie, I think you made some very, very good points, but what I am not clear on, and, and, and maybe, maybe not right this minute, but I need to make sure, and even if we send it out to the board, I need to be clear on exactly who is representing us with the legislators. I mean, I just heard Representative Love's name, I just heard... Uh, 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 our person, Charlie. Okay, but are we getting the results that we need? Now, maybe it's we haven't communicated to these individuals what we want, but I think that at this point in time, where they have their foot on our neck, okay, we can't be shy That's right. about taking a stance on things that we know that we are correct on. So, uh, yes, Dr. 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 Glover. So we do have um, two legislators who work with us. We have others who work with us, too, but who represent TSU are Harold Love and Charlene Alba. They've been very helpful, and they work with us. There are others that we call into this to assist us, too. Then we have the lobbyist um, um, Tony, Fred Tom Tony Thompson. Tony Thompson, and, and we also have Leah Love. So we have both of them representing us. Okay, so I want to shift and tell you something else as to what the importance of of getting the, the, the conversation we're having today. We had a meeting, and I'm going to share with this board. We had a meeting with the auditors, I'm going to say about six weeks ago. And at that meeting, we went through some things, and it seemed like at that time, it may have been one finding at the most at that time. So the question came up about, you know, I guess somehow the, the art of opinion, and it was almost like, well, I don't know what kind of opinion you're gonna get. You're gonna get. It was, it, it was, it was, it was so such a statement was made in such a manner that it it bothered us. It bothered us that we we're saying that we we know we're much better than we've often been in the past. We've corrected all this. They said, what do you mean? So she and I had some real words over that. I mean, real words over that. That uh, about an odd opinion 
Now, you raised your right hand like I did, and you took an oath that you're going to do what's right in the profession. Doug is a CPA. Dr. Ford is a CPA. You know, we understand it at a, at a high level. So to make a statement like that in front of her team, it was, to me, said a whole lot. To, I mean, the, the way it was said, all you had to do was say, well, we're still just working on it. You know, right now, you know, things are looking good. Whatever you can do, but, but why try to hold an honor opinion? That's the essence of what we do, an honor opinion. And so I, I did write her a letter recently. I mean, within, I mean, I guess it was last week, to ask her if she would, if they would, I just told her what the effect it had on us. And if they would mind, if TSU, that they got another CPA firm to work along with them at, CPA, at TSU's expense. Because the fairness of an opinion is the heart of your financial reporting, that, you know, the result of it. And so I want to know if it's in, if it's in order to ask this board if, they were, if, if, if you all would uh, allow us to consider to continue on this path to review. I mean, we're, they're, they're, have, they're about... 75, 80 percent complete now, but it doesn't hurt for a a big four, one of the CPA firms, to just take a look at our numbers because I don't know what's out there now. I do know that there is some concern about TSU and some things being said about TSU that's absolutely not true. Our finance is we're in the best finance position we've ever been in, and so I don't know what the why the noise continues to elevate from the comptroller's office. We don't trust what may happen there. And so, based on that, I think we ought to be proactive, as, as Dr. McKenzie said, and just let, there's nothing wrong with us getting a second opinion. Uh, May I uh, add something audit. to that, President? Uh, from a technical standpoint, and, and I will say, we know the, the standards, the technical standards. The technical standards require that your auditor to be independent, okay? regardless if it's a comptroller or a outside external CPA firm, all right? Any bias can then make your team think, okay, I've got to come in here and find something. There must be something wrong. So the, the lack of objectivity and, it, and independence, I think, is in question just from the bias standpoint uh, that we continuously face here. Um, throughout the last several months, We've been asked by the legislators, comptroller's office, and to provide so much information down to the penny. And we've always, always been able to do that. Okay? We've been asked to do things that the other institutions are not asked. I know that because I ask them throughout our CFO meetings, right? Um, they audited every single transaction. And, and I told them, I said, it's not in the current year. And... And as auditors, I understand you got to look at it. But to go to that detail, it was also stated at one of the hearings. One of the legislators said, well, what happened to the $3 million that's being the audit manager from the controls office? He testified and said, there is no missing money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the continuous, you know, wanting to beat us down when all we are doing is our job. Wait a minute, stop. They went back into a closed year and already issued, issued an opinion on Absolutely. to dig up some more information. They did. And, and that's when I told them, I said, you all have audited this information. The books are closed. But it's like, I've got to keep digging at you until we find something. And they haven't been able to do that. There are things that we are continuously improving. Uh, that's just day-to-day -day operations. But to constantly have your... Your, stat, your audit staff, case in point, they'll ask for something, we'll provide it, they'll go back and ask again and again, or try to ask somebody else for get a different response, okay? We, we try to work well with them, okay? That, that's our job is to work with, with, the, with our stakeholders, right? Comptroller's office being one of them. But we're constantly being attacked uh, for, for doing the work that we do and knowing what we have to do, period. So, so it, it, it's clear to me, and hopefully to you all, that we are not in a truth battle. We're in a political battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, what mm -hmm. I strongly, strongly suggest is that our September 13th workshop focus primarily on establishing 
a political engagement strategy of how best to move forward with this. We can fight truth with truth with truth, but in the bottom line, lessons learned last legislative session, people are not reading their stuff and are just taking people's words as gospel when it's not. So we need to be, in addition to being battling the truth, putting the truth out there, turning the light on, we need to be actively, proactively engaged in a political action campaign. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I've looked around this room uh, for ages, and I guess I'm about the oldest thing in here right now. And I'm thinking about what has happened to TSU over the years. And every time someone has been eliminated or someone has tried to eliminate something or people at the university, they always go to where the money is. Mm -hmm. That's the reason they look for the $3 million off the books, not for that year, but two or three years before. I've said this to someone, I'm going to say it to this entire trustee board. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We're in a political battle. Mm -hmm. And we've got to deal with the political battle, Madam President, and it starts with our political representatives, the people that know the people that make the decisions on Capitol Hill. I remember one particular individual who unfortunately became the uh, VP for finance at TSU, and one of his statements from one of his people who had worked for the controller at the state of Tennessee was drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. That statement was made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by a former mm -hmm. vice president for finance at TSU's assistant who had been the assistant to the auditor at the state of Tennessee. Every time you want to do something, get to the numbers. That's why they keep looking, uh, Vice President Allen. It will come through your department somewhere in your numbers. So therefore, you got to make sure you know more than they know, do more than they do. And Dr. Johnson and Madam President, this board needs to be the political arm mm -hmm. that it needs to be now and in the future. Amen. Madam Chair of the board, I hope you understand what I'm saying. And I hope you heard what Dr. Johnson has said. We have to have our own people do our own thing to be proactive and make things happen politically. So we have to tell our representatives, you can, and if Harold Love is one of ours, then we got to tell Harold Love what he's got to do. Or either we got to get somebody that's going to do it, one or the other. But speaking of being proactive, we need to also remember that there's, uh, an, uh, what is it, RFI, Request for Information on uh, Forensic Audit. So we need to be prepared for that. Am I correct, Dr. Yes. Glover? Mm -hmm. um, we have comfort in the yeah. fact that they're going, it's not going to be done by the comptroller's office. It'll be done by an outside CPA firm. That gives us comfort. Thank you, Jesus. It does. But I also know that they, you know, if you look for something hard enough, you'll find it. You know, if you look I mean, for something. Spend that kind of money. To and so, but we're 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 preparing now for that. We know they're gonna start with. The, we're gonna look at the president's spend spending. We know some things. Well, I've been a forensic. I've been audited like that before. I've done it, so I understand what they're how it's gonna come out. What they're looking for. They're looking for fraud of any type. So, I mean, unless that's something we don't know about, you know, you know, we, we're 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 not. So worried about that. It's just a time and that we're going to go through. I'm putting all this together for them to go through a forensic audit, a TSU. You know, it's just, I mean, at what point do you say it's enough? 
now? <laughs> well, there's two strategies. Right? You can you can break them or bankrupt them. It doesn't matter. The end result's the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I'm in favor of us bringing in a big four, uh, somebody above reproach, mm -hmm. um, uh, to handhold them or guide them. But we also need to change our strategy politically. When I was sitting before all of these other uh, Senate meetings and House meetings last year, um, I would look around the room prior to the meeting and count the UT representatives there. They don't have two. They don't have four. They have an army. I would strongly suggest that this year we engage and hire an army. Not just two, not just one, but let's get ten. Let's get people to be in people's offices, uh, and that's their sole job. Yeah. Not, not representing the beverage company and the tire company and everything else, just us. Let's wrap them in blue and get them there. Thank, thank you so much for this comment. I mean, this is so on point. So, what about so on point, Corbin? please. All right. Just uh, to follow up on Bill's point, I make a motion that we engage a top four, big four accounting firm to, per your previous comment, Dr. Yeah. Glover, so, to assist our audit team and the TSU. Second that motion. So could we say a big four or someone in the top? Right. Yeah, you because know, we got whatever. some business, a big national, a big four yes. or a national firm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's that exactly be, right. That, we'll I will that. amend my so, uh, Doug, do we BD right? who? Can we find a yeah. money? Can we find a money for BD, what's the name of that firm? KPMG. Yeah, um, whatever. No. Uh, so that's Crow. my motion, I think. That, that's Crow. Okay, we I'm not second it. This is what, this well, is six thirty twenty. So this is audit committee. So we would uh, really have the audit committee probably want to vote on that. So that would be um, Cole McKenzie and Penning. Got to make that motion. Coleman, McKenzie, oh, and Penning. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that Cole McKenzie and who? Okay, I, I make a motion that uh, we hire an outside big four or national firm okay. to conduct um, an independent okay. audit of the same period of time, 6-30-2022, not to work with the state, but to conduct an independent audit. Is that seconded? Second. Okay, it's been moved and five minutes second that we hire an outside um, uh, big four or national firm to conduct an independent audit for the huh? for the period 630 2022. Yes. Chair Cole. Aye. Trustee McKenzie. Aye. Trustee Pennock. Aye. Okay. So the motion is carried. Um, Mr. Lewis, I'll just your comment. I did see um, uh, Representative Love in an event last Saturday, and he uh, wanted me to assure uh, Dr. Glover and everyone else that he uh, will work on our behalf. Mm. Well, thank you, and I'll have to mention that to him the next time that I see him. And don't forget the real dog behind all of this. It's because of the amount of money that was uncovered by Representative Love and others, and Glover, and, Glover, Glover and, and the, what they've already paid and what they still owe. That's what the real problem is. They don't want to put out that kind of money to Tennessee State University, the youngest child in the group. I'll put it that way. Y'all know what I'm talking about, all right? All right. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is discussion of the audit. Um, One. Huh? Madam President, was you going to say something? Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, I, I, was, I, I wanted to it. ask Lawrence or you. Oh, okay. It was a question I was thinking. But will the state have to approve this? Well, before? I think so. And I say that because here in the state of Tennessee, the comptroller has the authority to either conduct the audit or... Uh, is, or issue an RFP for a independent CPA firm to do the work. So they would actually have to approve a firm to come in and audit. Now that's where we have to have, no, be no, no, politically. No, no, no. 
No, no, that's if they're doing the audit for the state's audit purposes. We're doing an internal audit from a third-party firm so that we can combat any findings that are wrong on their side. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think you're right. Trustee Johnson. Johnson. Yes. On behalf of okay. The state, but on behalf of TSU. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. That was a that was a problem that was in my mind. I know that's a cool. Because that's the reason I specifically said we don't want them to work with the state. We want them to conduct yeah. an independent audit. Okay. On behalf of TSU. And we so should we should give and yes and, and we should give whatever's requested and whatever audited from the you know. We need to prepare whatever they request so that we can ensure that we're ready from an internal standpoint right. for the audit coming up that they're going to do this year. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know we're working on that, but, I mean, we just need to be fully bucked up to ensure that we can respond to any findings because we won't have the excuse that's biased at that point because it's a third-party firm doing it. Can we, can we, do we know who the auditor is for the University of Tennessee? The University of Tennessee. Off. It's they the comptroller's office. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. They audit all the LG, LGIs. No. I, I okay, think we there's just, no external. No, sir. We'll look and see if any any, any other of the LGIs or UT have an outside auditor. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, but point. I think we just need to get a firm that has a specialty in educational Higher institutions. Okay. BDO. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, did you care to Yes, we did. Okay. It voted on it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. I think that's it. The next item on the agenda is discussion of the audit office's internal quality assessment information regarding the audit. Committee agenda item is included in your board materials for June 15, 2023 board meeting. I'm asking President Glover or her designated personnel to provide pertinent information related to the agenda item. This is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. Ms. Davis? You still there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the, the state of Tennessee requires the state internal audit offices to adhere to the standards of the Institute of Internal Auditors. Those standards require that you perform internal and external quality assessments. Internal assessments are ongoing, and we uh, do a report each year. It included in your board materials the internal assessment. And it's uh, to ensure that you're adhering to the standards of the IIA in conducting and performing the audit. And the external assessment has to be by an external party where we do an internal assessment and we have it validated by an external party. And they're due every five years. The last one was completed in 2018. So this year, 2023, would be five years since our last external audit. And we had the external validation by Craft CPA. So the new director will have to um, assess the office and then do the undertaking of securing an external party to validate the internal assessment when that time comes, preferably during the 2023 year. But uh, that's the purpose of this agenda item, to point out both the internal and external quality assessments and the timing. Okay. Now, by what time do we have to have this decision made? Well, you want to have the assessment performed every five years, but since there was a vacancy in the office, I think we will be okay in that regard. So if you could get it in 2023, it would keep you at the five year from 2018, but I don't know that that would be a problem if it's 2024, but we may want to stay on the safe side of things to just say by the end of the year, we want to have had that performed. Yeah, we need to stay on the safe side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's it for that agenda item. Okay, the next item on agenda is the review of outstanding audit issues. The materials for this agenda item are included in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I'm asking President Glover her does need to provide pertinent information related to this agenda item. This is an informational discussion item, so no vote is required. Okay, Dr. D Dr. Ms. Davis, continue. Uh, this is the listing of the outstanding issues from um, internal and external audits. You'll notice that the external audit that we just discussed with the single audit is included under the external audit portion. State law does require follow-up reports be submitted within six months. That report was issued at the end of March, so a follow-up report will have to be submitted by, I think it's September 26th, but it's exactly six months, the day of 
the report being issued. And the internal audits, they're all on the proposed audit plan for 24 for follow-up where the items are listed. Okay, so, so if I look on page 71, we have the follow-up review for federal work study time sheets that needs to be, oh, it needs to begin in June of 2023. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that's the closest one. Is that the, that's the closest one to the date right now? To the, yeah. to the current date? Yes, sir, Ms. Allen. Yes, one thing. <clears throat> in, as opposed to a firm coming in and doing the 22 work, since we're already past 22, I would maybe recommend we do it for FY 2023. But that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't, I think Dr. Glover's concern, now I, when will they issue the 2020? When will they give us the draft or the comments from the 2022 audit? When they finish field work. They're supposed to be done with field work in about two weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Glover's concern was, is this audit going to be fair? Now, we could, of course, wait to see their comments to see what they are. But if those comments go in the direction in which Dr. Glover is thinking, we don't need to wait to 2024 because what we would be contesting would be the 630-20. I mean, um, mm -hmm. we don't need to do it based on 630-23. We would need to do it based on 630-22 because that would be the period of time that we'd be contesting if it came out that way. Understand. Okay. okay. Um, I forget what I'm doing now. Okay, so that was the audit issues, and 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 um, Miss Davis, I still want to call you Director Davis. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming back and assisting us with this. Thank you, Dr. Glover, for uh, twisting her arm and getting her uh, to do that. Are there any other questions or comment? Did I forget something? Yeah, audit plan. Oh, where is that? Okay. I just have one quick well, question. Well, I'm going to go to the plan. Uh, yes. Um, the Federal Work Study Timesheet follow-up review, has that started? It's scheduled to start in June 2023. Miss um, Davis, has any work been performed at that today? Yeah, I, I have started the sample selection and doing the uh, beginning planning work for that engagement. Okay. So you, this is something that she's probably, you probably, take, you probably take these and... Yeah. and take a look at it and adjust yeah. as necessary. And, and Director Davis, I would ask you if, if um, at all possible, if you could um, meet with uh, our new internal audit, Director of Internal Audit, you know, say for, you know, in the next uh, month or so, just to bring up to date on where we are with things and, and she would get a better idea of exactly where she needs to pick up and deadlines, please, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah. yes, it would be my pleasure. Okay. No problem. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the... Well, well, before, you, before you go to the next item, just a, a point of clarification for me, maybe I missed it. Uh, is there a designated person responsible for a written strategy that's proactive and not reactive around communication strategy? Do we have someone? Is there a person we, we acknowledge as a person who's going to back with a report, with a strategy? We have the, we have the, the firm the PR firm, communications firm that we have engaged. And so they will probably take the lead along with our team here and, uh, and get a draft. And so we will probably sh we'll share a draft with the board so you all can give us y'all's comments. But that, that was going to be our starting point. When? Well, we got this meeting. We have to strat now go back and start a strategy. Give us some Monday. <laughs> yeah, to follow up, to follow up, we need to have an action plan in place yeah. prior to the beginning yeah. of the uh, legislative session. I agree. So. We need someone on our staff that is, is, is directly responsible for that report. And that's a critical report, in my humble opinion. Okay. Yeah, we, we really have to have that strategy in place, and it's urgent. It's something we need right now. And okay, I concur Dr. with Dr. Johnson and McKenzie. Okay, Dr. McKenzie, I, I think we have a very uh, capable person on staff that could be in charge of doing that, and I know I'm going to volunteer uh, Ms. Kelly to take care of that. Oh, who? Well, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, I'm trying to see what she's... No, no, no. What, what I was saying is that we will engage the PR firm that we're working with to work with our lobbyists that we have 
and uh, that's on the ground running. <laughs> that's what we said. Oh, well, you, she said you well except for yeah, except for one other thing. I want you to spearhead it and to be perfectly honest with you, I think this firm needs to be a bit more aggressive than they are. Okay? So I want you to I probably voluntarily you on this, okay? <laughs> to spearhead and be in charge of it so when we come back to look at somebody for for responsibility, it's yours. I, I, I do have concerns about this firm. I don't think they're as aggressive as I would like to see them be. I might just be me. Do we pay this firm? Yeah. Money? Yeah. Then we tell them what to do, when to do it, when to get on it, and when to slow up. Yeah. So we will, we will enhance their focus. Their focus has been public relations, working with you on media relations. Um, because we had legislative individuals, we will now incorporate that as part of the PR strategy. That's more the money. You know what you're saying, right? <laughs> they need to meet together, uh, Dr. Kelly. The PR firm and the legislative representatives, everybody needs to be in the same room on the same page. You can't have one arm knowing what the other one is doing when they're part of the same body. Okay, yeah. I just want to make this comment to be very clear. All these things that we're talking about are going to cost money. VP Allen, I need for you to make sure we have those funds available. Please understand that we are in a fight for our life, okay? And I know that VP Allen will find that money for us. We can't say it's gonna cost and we can't and we can't do it. Uh, she's gonna raise it, that's fine. Okay, but, but we, we can't say that. We've got to spend this money to make sure that we get the results that we need. And, 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 and Ms. Kelly, I want you to take a very strong uh, uh, stance with this, with this firm. And, and, and then I agree with him on the meeting of everybody getting together. Uh, and I may not know everything but uh, that's going on, but I will say I'm just not pleased with the aggressiveness right. of the firm. So we'll focus them on that and get that done, and I'll be quiet. And yes, sir, Dr. For, for our September 13th retreat, um, I'm suggesting that we have all parties at the table, everyone there, Sigenthaler, Absolutely. our people, Great idea. everything. Let's put them all in the same room and let's fight this out. Let's Great get a idea. strategy. Yeah. Okay, Attorney yeah. Pendleton, does that become a meeting that we have to make public or anything? Well, we were looking at the potential for that anyway. And, and, and now, remember, there are some other things that we're right. planning on doing that follows up from the AGB consultant's report. So I think what we're looking at, though, is probably an all-day yes. affair on that 13th, followed by the board meetings on the 14th. So for your calendars and your schedules, I would just keep that in mind. Yes. Okay. And the in-person or virtual? Great. Uh, yeah, I, we might want to make this virtual because, you know, we're asking people to take two days away from their businesses. I may be in error, so I'll, 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 Mr. Lewis is looking at me. Whatever the boy's pleasure is, is fine with me. Okay, but I just, my concern was that we are adding these things to that meeting and did it have to be an open meeting and just make sure we're legally covered. Yes, sir, Mr. Yeah. Lewis. But, but the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll reemphasize the president's point that we are in the fight of our lives and this is important. And we need to have everybody here so everybody that has agreed to serve as a trustee of the Tennessee State University, this is one of the times that you need to give up a day. And I hope you earn enough money to last your whole year by giving up one day for Tennessee State University. Well, thank you, Mr. Lewis. I will give up that day, and I'll send you a bill for that day's good work, okay? I, very well taken. That will be. I'll leave you in my will. That will be. Uh uh. That will be an in person uh, meeting. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Okay. Uh, where am I now? Audit plan. Oh, no, the audit committee. The next item on the agenda is approval of the fiscal year 2023 audit plan. 
the fiscal year 2023 audit plan is included for your review of the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. I'm asking President Glover or her designee to provide pertinent information related to this agenda item. Good. I'm going to ask Ms. Davis to go through it, but I'm going to also ask that if you make the motion, we have flexibility for our new direct return order to, to, to take a look at it and, and make the necessary any revisions that she's still doing before. Well, I, I think that's, that's I, I will given. say that, but that's a given. We, we are vesting in her the full authority of uh, that position. And also, one of my little quirks, if you send a letter out about an audit, on May 24th, I don't want to wait to the next board meeting to get my copy when it says it was copied to me. Okay. All right. Um, you. Ms. Davis. Okay. Yes, I have created the proposed audit plan that is subject to review and update and revision by the new director. It includes the required follow-up audits that we have related to the Division of State Audit for their 2022 audit, and then when they catch up and do the 2021 and 2022 audit of the uh, triple E, there's also an NCAA student assistance fund required audit, and then there are other areas included for review, including the Office of Financial Aid, Tuition and Fees Review, a general IT controls review. But this proposed audit plan is being submitted for your approval, and it is subject to revision and updating. I move for the audit committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the fiscal year 2023 audit plan, uh, along with comments and suggestions from our new director of internal audit as contained in the board, subject to comments and suggestions for our new internal auditors contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the fiscal year 2023 audit plan as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Cole. Aye. Trustee McKenzie. Aye. Trustee Pinnock. Aye. The motion is approved. Is there any additional business? Seeing none, um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting to enter into executive session for discussions of items deemed confidential under state law? So moved. Any discussion? Hearing none, the question is on the motion to adjourn the meeting to enter into executive session for discussion of items deemed confidential under state law. Secretary of Pendleton, please call the roll. I deem your your comment is a second as well. Uh huh. Yes. I think Hope is second. Okay. Oh, okay. I did. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Chair Cole. Aye. Chair uh, Trustee Penning. Aye. Trustee McKenzie. Aye. The motion is approved. We will adjourn and 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 uh, get. We need a five minute yeah. break. Okay. Budget committee is now called to order. Before we get started, we need to make certain findings on the record regarding the necessity for conducting this meeting by electronic participation without a physical quorum present. Committee members. Actually, I think we do have a physically present quorum with you and Trustee Corbill. The only person is Andre. So we don't need to go that route. We do have the physically present quorum. At this time, we need to call the roll. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Lewis. Here. Trustee Corbell. Here. And Trustee Andre Johnson. Trustee Andre Johnson. Okay. We have a quorum. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the March 16, 2023 Finance and Budget Committee meeting minutes. The minutes for the Finance and Budget Committee of March 16, 2023 meeting was included for your review in the board materials for June 15, 2023 board meeting. 
I move for the Finance and Budget Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16th, 2023 Finance and Budget Committee meeting minutes as contained in the board material for June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Uh, second with a comment. In a discussion, go right ahead. Um, Doug, I'm, just so you know, I read the minutes, Doug. So, yes, page 83, it says here scholarships for academics of $283 million. I don't think that's probably correct, just because $283 million is the number. Just we should correct page 83 at the top. It sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? So it's it? probably 28.3, or maybe there's a digit missing. Yeah, it's 28. So 28.3. Okay, so if we can make, you know, make that change in the minutes, just, uh, just thought that stood out a little bit. I know I said 28.3. <laughs> <laughs> you found that. that much in the budget? I'm impressed. <laughs> the question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the March 16, 2023 Finance and Budget Committee meeting minutes as contained in the board material for the June, 20, June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Okay, and that's as modified. Uh, so Trustee Lewis? Aye. Trustee Corbell? Aye. Trustee Johnson? Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the fiscal year. Mr. Lewis, before we go ahead, can we just, just real quick, could, could we introduce our, can we introduce the director that is now with us? <laughs> Construction. <laughs> the, the gentleman that is. This is a good place for him to be present. <laughs> no, just, I just, just wanted to just make sure that they were aware that you are uh, here, okay? Welcome. All right. Welcome. Will Radford, Assistant Vice President for Planning, Design, and Construction and Business Operations. Good. Thank Excellent. you. Welcome. Thanks, Will. Welcome. Thank you for appearing, sir. We <laughs> thought maybe you were a ghost at first, but you're here. <laughs> <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the approval of the fiscal year 23-24 tuition and mandatory fees in Greece. The material related to this agenda item are included in your review in the board material for June 15, 2023 board meeting. Pursuant to board policy 006, the board should consider several factors in evaluating tuition and mandatory fee increases, including the level of state support, total cost of attendance, which includes cost of tuition, mandatory fee, fees, room and board, books, and other applicable education expenses. Efforts to mitigate the financial effort on students. THEC mandatory tuition and fee ranges. Infl inflationary cost, tuition, and fee levels to parents institutions, tuition and fee level at competing institutions, student demand, and other factors <coughs> pertinent to the cost of the university's operations and program of study. Dr. Glover, our designee, will provide information in connection with this agenda item. Secretary Pendleton, the tuition transparency Act requires the issue to post notification of its proposed tuition fee increase at least 15 days prior to the ward meeting and allow the public to submit comments on the proposed fee increase. Were there any comments from the public? Chair Lewis, I did not receive any comments. In the notice that we posted, um, it was more than 15 days ahead of time, um, we included the contact information for the public to submit any comments that they would have on this to me, and I did not receive any comments. Thank you, Secretary. Penal, any questions or discussions on this matter? If not, I move for the Budget Finance and Budget Committee to recommend to the full board 
the approval of the fiscal year 2023-24 tuition and mandatory fee fees increase as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? <laughs> the question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the fiscal year 2023-2024 tuition and mandatory fees increase as contained in the board material for June 15, 2023. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Trustee Lewis. Aye. Trustee Corbell. Aye. The motion is approved. The next item on the agenda is the <coughs> approval of the fiscal year 2023 institution estimated budget. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is the approval of this estimated institutional budget. The material for the finance and budget committee agenda items are included on your review in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Dr. Glover or a designee will provide information in connection with this agenda item. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Allen, can you do it quickly? Yes, I just want to turn your attention to uh, page 96, I believe, in the packet. Yes, sure. So the estimated budget and then also the July proposed budget on the same document. So I'll just uh, quickly go down the estimated budget. Uh, the total education bill uh, revenues is $155 uh, billion. I apologize. Uh, the <clears throat> total revenues for education in general under the estimated budget is $155.6 million. Auxiliaries, $51.8 million, bringing the total of revenues to $207.3 million. On the July proposed budget, uh, we're looking at a just a small reduction in tuition and fees as we were not uh, bringing in as many freshmen as we did in, in, in August, yes. So it's about a 5% uh, decrease there. However, I do want to note that in the October budget, uh, there will be a slight uptick we'll see due to the approval of the hotels so we'll be able to bring on about 439 more students. So you'll see a, a small or an increase in the projection for tuition and fees uh, in the October budget. Uh, that's bringing total uh, revenues to 201.5 million. That's requested under budget uh, for, for July the 1st. On page 97. Could you uh, just, just, I'm sorry, Doug, just a couple of questions. Yes, there. sir. Um, just Briefly, because the estimated budget really is our year-end budget. Yes. So is there any, um, is there are some mater any material differences between the update we had last board? Nope. I mean, I think there's a few things that jumped out, you know, that were, and, <clears throat> and could we have anticipated any of those material sure. issues? It, it may be easier if we go to page 113. Okay. Okay. So when we're thinking about the estimated budget, and we're looking at uh, budget to year to date, uh, and this is through May 31st, okay, we'll see that our tuition and fees were budgeted for 99.2 million. However, we have exceeded that budget by 3.8 million right. uh, for 103 million. Uh, the state appropriation, we still have one more allotment or allocation for that <clears throat> that we receive at the end of uh, June. Uh, so that'll put us right on pace for the $47 million of state appropriations. The federal grants contracts, uh, the $2.5 million, that is our indirect cost that we capture at the end of June as well. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, we have about $11.2 million in additional revenues that we have not recorded that will be recorded in the month of June. But are reflected in the estimated budget, yes. though. So you projected that out. Correct. Cor in, okay. That's correct. So th that's kind of the difference, so to speak. Um, and when we talked about that last last board meeting, that, that, mm -hmm. that was anticipated. I think that was pretty close to those same numbers. That is correct. Okay. And uh, one more thing I'll note, um, just going down to the very bottom of the page in the second column, we'll see $14.6 million. Uh, that uh, says a deficiency, and I want to note, and this is very important, the board approved 
uh, back on June for the July 1, 2023 budget, I'm sorry, 2022, of $15.4 million of transfers, and that was due for, for the hotels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want, to, want you all to note that it is still on track that we did not exceed the operating budget from that standpoint, okay? And then the on the expenditure side, just again in the estimate about just trying to get it. And the reason I'm spending time a little time in this because this your base is always the most important thing is you're projecting Absolutely. into next year. So yes. if there's any kind of one time issue, one time budget issues, one time expense issues that we've actually normalized, or if there's material changes, just I'd like to for you to point those out. Uh, so the only change and which is included uh, in the July budget, proposed budget, would be the hotels. Okay. Conservatively, we went ahead and added that in because this budget is actually due in May to the Tennessee Board of Regents. Okay, yeah, right, so, right. Uh, but we did not uh, in include the yeah. revenues associated with that. Uh, again, that's just my conservative budget approach. That's good. Okay, uh, but other than that, that was really the the only uh, okay. only change there. And then all the discussions we've had earlier in the day with maybe some additional costs, we'll have to just embed those in the next. Mm -hmm. Kind of, the, the, there's a mid-year type. I can't remember what the right. term is, but you know, we so proposed budget, but then we have a second shot at correct it. in October. In October, not really seeing any major. Okay. Uh, now, one of the things, for example, with the board approving the use of a, a yes. outside CPA firm, those things will have to be considered and right. taken in in consideration. But we'll have that information. We'll just call you. those out as we yes as from an operations perspective. Agreed. And, and those are the main issues on the estimated budget for the year end. So I, I didn't mean to get in the way of your no, absolutely. next year. I appreciate your question. You're talking also about next year's right. July budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll then uh, go back to page 97 of your document. And that again, that just shows the breakout of our fee uh, of our revenue structure and how that is accounted for. Nearly 50% of our total revenues are generated from tuition and fees, 25% of that state appropriation. So we're always looking for new ways uh, to generate additional revenue, much like any other institution of public higher education out there. Uh, auxiliaries, 44.4 uh, million. That's down just a little bit from the 22-23 budget. Uh, that's because we had the, the influx of students that also generated more uh, revenues from the auxiliary side. Any questions on the the revenues for the proposed budget July 1, 2020, 30, 2024? All right. Thank you, BB Adam, you, Adam, you, Adam, for your information. Any additional questions or discussion? I just have a question. One, one last. I apologize, but no, where, you know. Part of the board's, you know, go forward, uh, you know, directive is not to be taking money out of reserves. Does this Correct. budget call for any kind of reserve transfers? So we have, we budgeted uh, $7.5 million. And that would cover hotels, uh, shuttles, and security. For 24. For, for 24. For 23, 24. However, I want to state that, again, that is the gross number. I always budget based on the gross number. Once we take into account uh, the additional tuition revenues that offset that, in addition to uh, the other housing revenue, it's about a 1.7 million uh, that would need to be transferred out of reserves at this right. present time. So much, much closer. I mean, clearly, yes. The, le the least we pull out of reserves ever is the better way to go, right? In, in One that. thing I want to note too, right quick, is that though we had the influx of students, I think Dr. Glover and her leadership. We managed that very well. I also want to state that uh, from an auxiliary standpoint, we brought in $1.9 million of, a, of additional funds, uh, that being incentives from Aramark uh, because of that. So there was always some extra revenue generation that we knew about, but it was not necessarily presented uh, because that's not a normal operating activity. Right. And I would yeah. say year over year, just for those that are interested, the the big difference on the expense side is the vast reduction in the scholarship dollars just yes. because of the enrollment change. That is correct. I mean, that's because our revenues actually are going down and our expenses are still going up slightly right. year over year. But the big driver of the year over year reduction in expenses is that scholarship. scholarships. And, and uh, to be perfectly clear, 
we had <clears throat> presented to the legislators and also to this board at the last board meeting uh, that you all approved the scholarships <clears throat> budget, it was $21 million. And that's what you will see in this budget. 19 million of that is on the ENG side. 2 million of that is on the auxiliary side, right. totaling the 21 million. Right. If there is a change in that number that exceeds a 10% cap, that will then be brought forth to the board for approval. So I, I said, and back to Chair Lewis, I'll second that as far as the, your recommendation. Any additional discussion? Yeah, if, if I can um, just point out some highlights from the faculty perspective uh, in the expenses, uh, proposed expenses for 24, when you take instruction, research, and academic support and combine those and divide them by the total E and G, we are approaching our 50% goal. Yeah. So uh, we are 49. at 49.59. We like to see it at 51, but we'll keep working on that. So that's good. So our business is education, and we are spending about half of our money uh, on that, and that's good. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Allen and President Glover. Thank you. Any additional discussion? The question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the institution's estimated budget as contained in the board materials for June 15, 20, 23, 40. <coughs> Secretary Pemberton, please call the roll. Chair Lewis. Aye. Trustee Corbell. Aye. Trustee Johnson, Andre Johnson. Okay. Question, observation. Of V.P. Allen, I received an email regarding Appendix B, Finance and Budget, Committee TSU budget narratives. Did that come to me only, or was that sent to every board member? That was sent to the entire board. So every board member received this appendix B. Yes. That's all I need to know. Thank you, sir. Let me know that. Agenda item number six approval of the fiscal year. 2024 institutional proposed budget. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the fiscal year 2024 institutional proposed budget. I'm sorry, I thought I talked loud enough. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, okay. So I actually I just kind of provided an uh, overview of the 23. 24 budget, so I'm requesting approval of that at this time. Did you say we've already done it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Did we uh, move on it? Yeah. No. The question is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of fiscal year 2024 institutional proposed budget as contained in the board materials <clears throat> for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Lewis. Aye. Trustee Corbell. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Motion is approved. The next item is the university budget updates. Is does that require any action? No. Can we move to the next item? Yes. The next item is the capital plan and development update. The next item on the agenda is the capital plan and the development update information regarding this finance and budget committee agenda item is included in your board materials for June 15, 2023 board meeting. President Glover, please provide pertinent information related to this agenda item. Uh, so that particular item there is just a information item only. All right. Therefore, do we go to the end item nine? Yeah. Approval of the institution's FY 2023-24 capital construction plan addendum. The next item on the agenda <coughs> is this approval. Materials for the Finance and Budget Committee agenda item are included for your review in the board materials for June 15, 2023. 
Dr. Glover or her designee will provide information. Uh, yes, ma'am, we'll do. Uh, so this particular item is approval for a capital construction plan addendum. Uh, in the June 2022 meeting, the board approved the 250 million strategic capital plan. That was the strate strategic initiative funds uh, that the state uh, owed Tennessee State University. Uh, the amendment to that would include a main campus gateway entrance. Uh, the, the location of this would be on uh, the intersection of John A. Merritt Boulevard and 31st Avenue, and that is in your packet. No, oh, what page? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, if everyone had a chance to take a look That's at that, if you have any questions, uh, I'll entertain that at this time. If not, I am requesting approval for this. So, it's just, just in an amendment to the previous issue. Yes, sir, that is. Yes. And just part of the whole master plan. Correct. So, is this the final look? No. Okay. Okay. Tweaking is good. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's going to be some more tweaks to it. Like, we're going to put. We're going to put Think, Work, Serve on it. You know, it could be some fine little tweaks to it, but it want you to approve the concept. Yeah, I just don't think it looks modern, so. Thank you. Any additional discussion? You may want to touch on the timing of when that's going gonna, gonna to okay. be up for the fall. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so we plan to begin this project um, very, very soon. Uh, we'd like to have it completed by September okay. prior to homecoming. Any additional discussion? I move for the Finance and Budget Committee to recommend to the full board the approval of the institution's fiscal year 2023-2024 capital construction <coughs> addendum as contained in the board materials for the June 15, 2023 board meeting. Is, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Portion is on the motion to recommend to the full board the approval of the institution fiscal year 2023-2024 capital construction plan addendum as contained in the board materials for June 15, 2023 board material. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Aye. Chair, uh, Trustee Crabell. Aye. Item 10 calls for finance and Budget report is there a vote on this particular uh, report? This report requires no vote. I would recommend that we move to the next item, which will be um, item number 11 report on the student scholarship and enrollment. Is there a vote on this particular item? We've got to get an update. This is no, we, we we should get enough. Is it when you come to the table? You might come to the table, Mrs. Is it? Uh, Miss Denzel, bittersweet, but congratulations on your new assignment. Miss Denzel will has got a tremendous offer at another institution. Oh. We want to thank him for oh. all that he did for us, and um. I'm available to be your assistant. <laughs> Are you trying to say he's no longer going to be a part of us? You got it. I don't recall him requiring my right. approval of that. <laughs> uh, that was that email that you got that you clicked on. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> and may I ask while I'm thinking about who's taking this place? Well, the new, our new COO is going to uh, organize, look at the structure of enrollment management. And right now, he's going to start doing the, so take on that on his umbrella. But for right now, we have Dr. Deems until uh, the new COO can get everything up to spark. We got Dr. Deems, who is in the back. Dr. Deems, why don't you come up here, too? <laughs> uh, let's get another share. Let's get another chair, slide it up. Oh, is yeah. the CEO in the room? Oh, yeah. Yes, he's, there he he's is. In is right he back there? back there? He's still here. There is. Jason's back there. I just want to make sure he knows what he's got his hands on. <laughs> got a tiger by the tail. 
Duly noted, sir. Proceed, Mr. Izzard, please, if you would. Uh, thank you, Chair Lewis. It's an honor to be here today, and thank you, President Glover, for inviting me back to uh, just this uh, this great opportunity. Uh, just briefly, I know that the day is far spent. Let me just take a, a, a point of personal privilege to say that I want to thank uh, the Madam President and the distinguished members of this board for allowing me the opportunity to support our students alongside with the cabinet members. And as we fulfill the mission of TSU, I really, it's been a highlight of my 28 year career in higher ed. So thank you, it's been a blessing. Uh, you already have the board materials that I've prepared for you today. I'll briefly go over five, four, four quick points. Uh, I'll talk about the five year trend data, application data, our enrollment, uh, intent to enroll data, give you updates on fall projections, and then kind of close out with a quick update on the scholarships, which will include a review of our scholarship policy, as well as a budget uh, update of the funds dispersed year to date. As it relates to the uh, scholarship data, we're pleased with the application data for fall 2023. I'm sorry, as it relates to the application data. We really feel positive about that. In your report, you'll find that the total number of completed applications for fall 2023 term um, that number is evident um, showing that the executive leadership team as well as the enrollment management professionals have improved our management of the completed application process to better align with our fall capacity. Um, you can see the number is considerably lower. Uh, that was by intention. And uh, thanks to our new CRM system, the admissions operations team has been able to strategically oversee the admissions operations process and closely track the total number of applicants and the number of admitted students for the upcoming school year. So we're pleased with that. Um, furthermore, we are fortunate to have a new director of admissions, Mr. Lamar Scott. Uh, he's, he possesses an excellent understanding of the admissions funnel and is well versed in the best practices for guiding students through the application process. He's doing a great job. Of course, Dr. Verante Deems, the Assistant Vice President for Admissions and Records, has also contributed to this process by providing additional management and oversight. Me, that's Dr. Deems sitting next to him. Yeah, this is the guy. <laughs> He's done a great job. And um, you should note that the results uh, really reflect Dr. Deems' work um, and his team. They've been diligently monitoring these numbers, providing daily updates to President Glover, and also offering comprehensive review of the admissions process to the uh, president and weekly reports to the cabinet. In summary, we feel strong about fall's class and looking at the data, we're on target. Um, as, you, as you go through that report, I also provided uh, information regarding the uh, intent to enroll um, and those processes. Um, I won't uh, spend a lot of time on that, but generally we yield about 73, 74% looking at the five-year data trend. And uh, our target goal for this fall is uh, 2,000 students, which is considerably lower than where we were last year. Um, I also provided in the report um, projections on the housing data. Um, we have a considerable um, number of students that have already raised their hand and said they're going to be online for the fall. And we have another group of students that say they're going to be doing uh, commuters. So we really feel good about roughly um, landing at about 1,200 in terms of first-time freshmen being in housing. Uh, if I may, I, I asked Dean Stevenson this, so I feel like it's only fair to ask you this. Sure. Too. We, uh, we obviously, as a board, are concerned to make sure that we're aligning our enrollment with our housing. That's incredibly important because, you know, we learned a lot what happened last year. You, you also mentioned something about your trend of, you know, percentages of those that actually come that are admitted, but then that come, but we used a five year, but last year we had, what, a 40%? Uh, acceptance rate versus the 30, 41. So the, the question I have is, is that shouldn't we at least be using the 41 as a percentage? Be conservative versus, and maybe I heard that different, but you, you, I thought you just said you were looking at our five-year average. Well, the five-year average may not be the right way to look at it, given, you know, the popularity of TSU, the number of kids that want to come here, 
So I'm just challenging you to say, okay, we, if we looked at the 41 acceptance rate and matching up with what Dean Stevenson's doing with housing, are we still in a good place? Yes. Let me go first. The reason we're not looking at 41% this year is because we got out to a good start last year. We got offers out, scholarship offers to students. Students come based on scholarship and financial aid. So we got them to them last year as early as November and December. But this year, because of, you know, there was so much criticism, we didn't, uh, the scholarships budget was not approved until March. Yeah. And so we couldn't extend as many scholarships at, at that rate at the same time period. So we did extend scholarships. By the time they got them, some of them were, had already accepted offers out of the school. So we lost a lot of students based on timing. Then there was some who got the negative press that we weren't having the housing. We had all kinds of factors that, that I think no one will, I mean, it's hard, it's difficult to even conceive, just, just to conceive how we were hurt by the, the legislative and elected comments like that about the TSU housing. But I think the big thing is we could not offer scholarships early. And so we, that was early, different from last year. Yeah, last year, which was quite different. Last year, by December, we had a lot of students who would say yes, because they were going on in momentum. But what happened is the legislature slowed down our momentum this year. I hear you. I mean, we had the Grammy Award. We had so much momentum. Students still want to come. We just say no to students yeah. because we didn't have the scholarship. It was not no to We just say no, we don't have your financial aid package yet yeah. because we didn't have the scholarships approved yet. So we got right on it and tried to catch up in March, but it was too late. Well, I'm just, I'm just being more conservative if we could at least, I hear what you're saying, Dr. Glover, but if, if it happens to come in at 40%, I want to make sure that I'm hearing that we still could accommodate up to that amount. We have a little bit of room, so to speak, you know, because again, we didn't anticipate it last year. Maybe we won't, won't happen again this year, but maybe it might. And so I think as an institution, we just got to be flexible enough and from a planning perspective to say we have a little bit of room just in right. case. And, and, and just a side comment, um, as we do our political strategy planning, uh, we need to communicate the damage and the harm that they have, commu they have created upon us. I promised Dr. Glove I was not going to make a comment, but, but I do I have just three so. very quick questions. Okay, one, um, just is I want to commend you on, and the other members of that committee, the scholarship committee, uh, work very diligently to make sure that the terms and information was spelled out very clearly. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time going over those. It does not include room and board, or et cetera. We were very um, uh, definite on that, and thank you for your leadership on that. Second thing is the, the, the page to which Dr. Glover was referring is page 148. Uh, where the, the full amount of the scholarships were not issued. The second thing is, where is the band and athletics scholarships? Where are they included? They're included in the total budget that you heard VP Allen mention, and he has a schedule of those awards that are into, uh, that are um, set, set aside for them. So they're not part of the academic merit? Right? These are just academic merit, yes, ma'am. Okay, got it. Thank you. So on, on, any other comments or questions? <laughs> All right, so... The last part I'll share briefly is around the scholarships. Your report shows you a year to date uh, where we are with the scholarships in terms of the institutional merit scholarships. And uh, in here, our team really works closely with Chair Cole um, and also the VP's office, VP Allen's office, to closely monitor and manage that scholarship process in the Office of Institutional Merit Scholarships, which is led now by Ms. Holly Blakemore. She's the Senior Scholarship Coordinator. She does a great job, and also she's assisted by Ms. Megan Gosa. Now, that's a big change because we never had a separate office managing that process. And what that office does is they provide weekly reports to President Glover, to Vice President um, uh, Allen, as well as Vice President Dr. Uh, Assistant Vice President Dr. Deans, and that committee giving them insight and oversight and updates on each award and in your packet you see a sample of where we are year to date that was as of the reported date um, if you look at the bottom we're currently roughly still three mil million that's available you know and as president glover alluded to uh, i really think that the damage from so much bad press and um, really getting those the timing we had those awards 
ready to go last year in uh, October and students. And then if you look at the criteria, it's very competitive, you know, so you've got the GPA and test score that's really high. And when you're trying to get a better student, those students are all taken up by October, honestly. So um, hopefully a good recommendation going forward would be in our next board meeting to kind of, you know, get those the approvals and then we can get the awards out we'll, beginning in the fall. We'll bring the scholarship budget to you in the September meeting so that we could get those, uh, get that information out to you, to the board and get it approved and get so we can start getting letters out to students. Because, you know, the early bird gets the worm. And so when, you, when we get started in March, it's really too late. Yes, sir. Yeah, can we, um, um, can we get a, a table breakout um, of scholarships, first-time freshmen, returning maybe sophomores, juniors, seniors, those kind of things, broken out, and then uh, uh, band, athletics, uh, uh, other ones like that, all those broad categories. I'm sure that the, that data is available to the new team leader, and I'm sure they'll be able to be provide that Thank information. I have one, one more ask um, for no, Mr. Izzard, maybe not for you, but whoever is coming in your big shoes to fill. But we can't lose that advantage of that big freshman class. So to me, you know, what are we... What are we going to do, or maybe you can report the next board meeting, what are we doing specifically for that big freshman class to retain them? Yeah, because I can. We, 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 you know, that was such a good thing, although yeah. others may we'll think differently. Here. It was such a great thing for our university. Definitely. But if we don't retain them, no. we're just going to lose that momentum. So I would just ask that maybe we talk about that in the next, maybe at the next board meeting. We can, but we can tell you some about it now, that, that those students are returning. Um, I think Dean Stevens had mentioned this morning how how many had already applied for housing. And then D Dr. Melton has a specific plan. Is Dr. Melton back there? I can't see. Dr. Melton, you want to come and talk about the, the, the retention plan that you all have put in place? Retention moved over to academic affairs. And well, Dr. Melton. Where I'm, where I'm headed with that is part of our communication government relations plan. Mm -hmm. If the percentage that, if we can show that the percentage of those yes. folks stay is higher yes. than what they've been in previous years, oh, yeah. then we can take away all the nonsense of why all this stuff happened. Oh, Everybody, no. we weren't ready for this. We're retaining good, strong students. That data is critically important to me. And that needs to be communicated, proactive. Our communications yep. plan, I said. Exactly. So. That's Melton. Yes, um, on behalf of not just academic affairs, but in cooperation with student affairs, um, we have a retention um, center as well as an academic coach center. And this center reaches out not only to on campus, but off campus. In fact, we, including myself, personally go out to the hotels, um, riding the shuttles to make sure that we are addressing student needs. So with this large class coming through, we are following them in terms of tracking, monitoring them, as well as the classes to making sure that they are going to meet our timeline in terms of graduation. So we have built in academic and student affairs services for this group. Chair Corbett, uh, Mr. Corbell, I also mentioned that um, we have the first year experience and Dr. Tasha, Tasha Carson, along with first year advisement, they've registered over ha half of those students already for the fall, which compared to the previous year, that's up considerably. So as Dr. Melton said, with the retention team and the student success and the student uh, engagement and Dr. Deems, the whole campus is really focused on the retention of those um, first year students that came in last year. I think you'll be pleased. Yes, and I just would like to end not only for the sophomore class coming through, but for the freshmen. We have all of our faculty and staff ready for fall 2023. If any additional discussion, this was for informational item discussion only. No vote is required. So therefore, we'll move to our next agenda item, number 12, Board Housing Committee Report. 
or do we think we have this enough information already? Actually, can I uh, just, Trustee Pinot. Can I have a point of uh, oh. privilege? Uh, Mr. Izzard, Is I would just like to thank you for, you know, I've, many of us have been on the board a while now, and, and we've come a long way, and, and no, no, be, not, not only because of your leadership, the team you built, so we, we, I just want to thank you on my personal behalf, and I'm sure on the board's behalf. And I second that motion. Thank you very much. By the way, you have to come back and visit us. Don't stay gone too long. <laughs> the housing report. Um, yeah. Van Pinnock, if you're on the line, you have comments at this time, sir? Yeah, Trustee Pinnock is not able to uh, provide information. He's uh, in, in route. Uh, okay. We could, if there are any other of the housing committee members that wanted to, Make a comment. They could if they're on the line. I, you want to I want to say I think we should we should really uh, commend Trustee uh, uh, McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie worked many hours on this partnership that uh, just trying to assist with housing. I'm not sure if he wants to say anything about that, but I think the board just owes him a debt of gratitude for what he did for getting this. Just trying to assist. Uh, is he still on the line? McKenzie still on the line? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. So thank you, very much. thank you very much. Can I start that round of applause? And thank you. And he's used a lot much. of relationship capital on these projects, a lot. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to say that, that uh, I've been in, in uh, conversations with our new uh, employee that's in the working for Doug Allen. Um, and... Uh, I'd like to just say for my preliminary discussions with him, he's certainly a, a, a talent that that we should be uh, very proud of having on board. He's very familiar with PPPs uh, and uh, the uh, opportunities that I've put to uh, Chairman Pennick are PPPs, and he's going to be very helpful around that. He's also going to be very helpful in getting us through the uh, Tennessee Board of Regents process uh, and the RFP process that will be necessary to make sure that we're not showing any favorites to the proposals that we have received for both the House of God uh, opportunity for 1,500 beds and the additional beds that would be available to us if we went forward with a 99-year lease on our Avon campus uh, property. I will say that uh, um, the consortium is still in place and still engaged, that consortium uh, that we've been able to put together to include Turner Construction, McKissick & McKissick, Moody Nolan, who's already engaged on the architectural side, uh, and uh, the investment banking community with which I'm very familiar is also very much engaged. Um, one last uh, consortium member that, uh, that I have added to the table since last week uh, is a company called Maverick, uh, which has uh, a solar panel installation product that I brought into the conversations with Moody Nolan and with Turner Construction for the following reason. These particular solar panels uh, reduce the cost of energy in running any facade or any building on our campus. Uh, and so if, in fact, uh, our engineers uh, in, in uh, collaboration with Turner Construction and the architect, Moody Nolan, felt that it was value-added in terms of its ability to do two things. One, reduce the cost of energy, and two... Uh, to generate revenue, which can be used at our directive for scholarships or anything else, and that revenue would come from from carbon credits. Uh, as uh, the uh, Biden's IRA bill is engaged, that we as a university should stay in front of opportunities to advantage uh, our population, our school with the new legislation under the IRA bill. And when, in fact, you reduce the carbon footprint for energy 
by the use of renewables such as solar, uh, that generates opportunity to uh, that creates an opportunity to engage in a new market called carbon credit market, which is a revenue generation opportunity. So we're engaged. We've I've brought them to the table to uh, have in-depth conversations with uh, Turner and with Moody Nolan and um, with the other members of the consortium that we have. So I wanted to share that uh, from the Housing Committee on behalf of uh, Chairman Pinnock. Wow, that's great stuff. And uh, Chairman Pinnock was uh, invited to that collaboration, and we had that call this week with Maverick, and we'll be reporting back to you uh, about uh, about that and what that would do to bring additional revenue uh, to uh, to the university and to reduce the cost of the new dormitories that we're trying to get in place. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McKenzie. Is there any additional business to come before this committee? Just let you know, Mr. Rennick is a uh, graduate, graduate, of graduate of Tennessee State University. So. Wonderful and marvelous. Glad to hear that. <laughs> Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move that the committee adjourn the meeting. Second. Secretary Pendleton, please call the roll. Chair Lewis. Aye. Trustee Crabill. Aye. Now, I hope everyone enjoyed this meeting and enjoyed their meal. I'll try it now for myself. <laughs>